As we entered the hospital, I looked around and saw several families with young kids in the waiting area. A few of them glanced my way, and the light caught their eyes, revealing irises tainted a crimson hue. They glowed red like old photos that hadn't developed quite right. There were so many children experiencing the same symptoms as my daughter Rachel, and yet I hadn't seen anything on the local news. Still, word was beginning to spread around town that there was a contagion going around. Only amongst the children. At least for now. The triage nurse looked us up and down, scribbling something on a piece of paper. I handed her the necessary identification, including my Proteon company ID badge, then took a step back and waited for her questions. Symptoms? Red eyes? Poorly timed laughter? Odd statements? No suspicious cravings? I gulped down a dry lump in my throat, thinking about what my daughter had said that morning at the breakfast table. Nope. I lied. The nurse gave me a hard, cold stare for a few moments, then scribbled something and continued her questions. And how long has this been going on for? Just today. The red eye started about 20 minutes ago. That's why I brought her in here. Okay. Have her put on this wristband. Wait over there to be called in. Don't touch anything. It shouldn't be long. My daughter snapped the band onto her wrist, and it made an electronic chiming sound. Two green lights lit up on either side, next to the Proteon company logo. The mega corporation, which ran the high-tech corporate town where we lived. When I first took the job in Pleasant Hills, I thought it was an idyllic, perfect place to raise a family. When the recruiter told me about the salary and benefits, I nearly jumped for joy. But now I was starting to understand that this quaint little town was not entirely perfect. There was something spreading amongst the population. Something unlike anything I'd seen or heard of before. The two of us sat down in the waiting room, and my daughter began to eye the toys and books in the corner. Without asking, she stood up and wandered over to the table piled high with reading material. Rachel, I called out, but she didn't stop. A woman sitting near the book stood up quickly and moved away, as if someone with leprosy were approaching. I felt a pang of anger, but realized I couldn't blame her. None of us knew what we were dealing with yet. I was more than a little afraid, too. Rachel picked up a colorful kid's book and began to look through the pages, scanning the print quickly with her red eyes darting back and forth. She seemed to realize the woman next to her was staring and turned her head to glare at her. Then she made a loud hissing noise, like a territorial street cat. She snapped her teeth and lunged at the woman, and I jumped up and pulled her back. Rachel, no, what are you doing? She went back to looking at the book as the woman ran out of the waiting room, screaming. She's got it too. I looked over to see a man with his daughter and son. The three of them were dressed as if coming from church. But there was something wrong with his kids' expressions. Something unsettling. They were staring at me with wide, vacant grins. Their eyes were glazed over, and their teeth looked too sharp, as if being drawn out by some invisible force, being stretched and sharpened into fangs. The changes were subtle, but noticeable. Yes, just today I began to see the... changes. Lord help us. How long have your children... Winters? Rachel? A woman's voice called from the door to the ER, interrupting our conversation. Winters! Rachel! I stood up quickly and grabbed her hand. She brought the book with her. I I'm sorry, she grabbed it before I could stop her. I said to the nurse, gesturing at the book. The woman looked unconcerned. Keep it. She was wearing a respirator mask, gloves, goggles, and a bright blue full-body protective suit as she led us into a room. A sign on the door read, Negative Pressure Room. 
Should I be wearing a mask? I asked her as she left. Probably, but you'd be exposed by now anyway. The doctor will be with you shortly. Exposed to what? I yelled. The door sealed shut with a hiss and a bang. The woman stood outside for a few moments, taking off her suit, but made no effort to communicate with us or answer my question. A huge window at the front of the room allowed us to see into the ER, and we watched as she disappeared into the crowd of nurses, doctors, and patients. The two of us were left alone in eerie silence. Rachel opened up the book again and sat down cross-legged on the floor. The parent part of me wanted to tell her to get off the ground, since who knew what had happened in there? But she looked so innocent for those few moments I couldn't bring myself to do it. She looked like herself again. Like a normal kid. Except for those red eyes, glowing as she glanced up at me. The PA came on suddenly. A woman's frantic voice began to speak. Code Crimson in effect. Code Crimson in effect. All security personnel to the emergency waiting room now. The message repeated again two more times, then the speaker cut out again. What's a code crimson, Daddy? Rachel asked, looking up from her book. Is it a fire? I don't think so, honey. I think it means something different. Just keep reading your story. A shrill scream came from outside the room, and I looked out through the large window into the ER. For a few seconds, there was nothing. My heart pounded dully in my ears, and I could feel it in my throat as I gulped down a dry lump. A woman in pale green scrubs raced past, blood shooting from a fresh wound on her arm, spraying the wall red as she ran by. She was screaming and looking over her shoulder, sprinting like her life depended on it. Gunfire could be heard from down the hall, in the waiting area where we had just been. Get down, I yelled at Rachel, running over to her. Someone's shooting. I ran over to my daughter and pulled her behind a chair, which was up against the wall. The two of us hid behind it, and I heard people running past outside, but was too afraid to look. The gunfire was constant now, and getting closer. I could hear things breaking outside the room from stray bullets, and just hoped one wouldn't find its way into us. Daddy, I'm hungry, Rachel said quietly. Not now, honey, please. How could you be thinking of food at a time like this, I wondered to myself. More gunshots rang out, sounding very close now. I ventured a glance out from behind the chair we were using as cover. Through the glass, I saw men in black body armor with machine guns in their hands. They were firing rapidly and backing up, moving away from the waiting area. Security enforcement officer was written on each of their uniforms with the company name Proteon beneath that. I recoiled in surprise as something leapt through the air like a wild animal, tackling one of the security guards and sending him flying backwards, his gun firing as he fell. His repeated screams were heard muffled through the door a few seconds later. It was the children with red eyes. Dozens of them from the waiting room were now rampaging through the ER, chasing nurses and doctors, running around on all fours like animals. A few people were on the ground, and the children appeared to be feeding on them, ripping out their throats and feasting on their bloody flesh. The power suddenly shut off with a dull click, and the ER was cast into total darkness for several long moments. I'm so hungry, Daddy, Rachel said from behind me, moving closer. The emergency lighting switched on suddenly, and everything was cast in a dim glow from above. I spun around to see my daughter moving towards me, a hungry look in her eyes. She was smiling like a starving piranha, and I could see her teeth growing insidiously longer, drawing into needle-sharp points. What are you doing, Rachel? Stop! Don't get any closer! I felt as if I shouldn't let her know how scared I was. If she could sense my fear, I worried she would lunge at me like a wild animal. Something slammed into the glass behind me, and I spun around to see a teenage boy smashing his forehead repeatedly against the window, his eyes a blazing, burning red. 
the glass began to spiderweb and slowly crack from its center, and I heard it crunching and breaking from each impact as he bashed his skull against the window again and again. I was so caught up in the sight of that, I nearly missed the reflection of my daughter lunging at me from behind. But I saw it at the last second, and dove out of the way, surprised at my own quick instincts. The glass shattered as she crashed into it and went flying through, landing hard against the boy on the other side. Something was wrong with them. Something very, very wrong. And my fight-or-flight instinct suddenly took over. More specifically, my flight instinct. I leapt through the shattered window, broken glass piercing my palms, and began to run back towards the waiting room. When I looked over my shoulder, I saw my daughter and the teenage boy were scrambling to their feet, racing towards me on all fours like jungle cats, their eyes blazing red. The horrifying sight of them chasing me distracted me from my route, and I found myself slipping in fresh blood, sliding and wrenching my back as I fell down in the middle of a sticky red puddle. I hit the ground hard and bit my tongue, tasting coppery blood a second later. Stay down! Someone screamed from behind them and began to fire. Thankfully, I saw they weren't shooting bullets. Small syringes of green fluid impacted nearby, missing them. But a few found their targets, and the two of them turned around, racing back towards their attacker. Their movements weren't even slowed by the heavy dose of tranquilizer. The man screamed as the two of them took him down, tearing off his black body armor and feeding on his flesh a second later. He screamed in pain and yelled at me to run. After a moment's hesitation, I began to sprint back towards the entrance where we'd come in. A pair of sliding steel doors separated the waiting area from the ER. I raced towards them and began to hammer my fists against them, screaming to be let out. Looking up to my left, I saw a security camera pointed at me. I haven't been bit! I screamed, thinking for some reason that might be important. Maybe I'd just seen one too many zombie movies. Please, let me out! Maybe that was the right thing to say, since the doors open and I burst through them a second later. Two security guards in heavy armor were on the other side. They were closing the door as I looked back through and saw my daughter racing towards us, blood smeared around her mouth like strawberry jam. Then the steel doors slammed shut. My daughter's in there! I screamed. We gotta help her! Something impacted the steel door on the other side, deforming the metal and bending into the shape of a child's skull. It's us you should be worried about, the security guard said. I looked around and saw the hospital was being sealed. Thick steel shutters were closing slowly and blocking out the sun, casting the waiting room into semi-darkness. Code Crimson lockdown protocols in effect, a robotic voice said from overhead. Shelter in place and do not approach the infected. Do not attempt to reason with the infected or to speak with them. Do not make eye contact. Assistance is on the way. Do not panic. Another loud bang came from the steel door separating the waiting room from the ER. And I saw a gap was forming. A gap big enough to see through. An eye peered through. Looking familiar, except for the color of it. Crimson, like a sunset. Peekaboo daddy, my daughter said, giggling. I see you. You've got a new match. My hormonal teenage self couldn't have been more excited. I quickly lost interest in the homework I had been working on that night, and opened my phone, almost as fast as it could light up with a notification. I clicked on the icon, staring intently until Tinder opened. Of course I was excited. I ran all the possibilities in my head, all the things that could happen. This could be the girl of my dreams. No, it didn't appear as though I matched with the girl of my dreams. This looked more like the girl from a nightmare that would shake the vilest creature in the deepest pit of hell to its crooked bones. Smiling from ear to ear, literally, was my match in the first picture on her profile. No name, no age, 
only a picture. The photo itself seemed to be professionally taken. It was a full body picture. She was dressed in some sort of very formal black dress, and there was nothing about her body that seemed out of the ordinary. She had black hair that was down and presented nicely, likely for this picture or whatever event this picture was taken for, but I didn't give much thought to that and you'll understand why. Her skin was well kept and seemingly unblemished. Come to think of it now, her face was the only off-putting thing about the picture. But oh god, the face. Her eyes didn't sit where the sockets should be. They bulged out, seeming far too large for her face. They had no whites. The irises were everything. They were a dark purple, almost black. The eyes had no details, they were just blank. Empty. Her teeth were normal human teeth, and there would have been nothing wrong with them if she didn't have many, many more than any person should have. Her jaw opened wide. Very wide. It opened from the bottom of one ear to the other, teeth showing in their entirety as she gave a nice big smile to the camera. I was disgusted by whatever Photoshop job this must have been, but I was also intrigued. It was a really good edit after all. I thought it must have been some artist who wanted to show off their skills or something. But before I engaged in any chats with this match, I noticed they had more photos. Five more. I swiped to the second one. The same girl in the same dress and all the same grotesque facial features was front and center in this photo once again, but both the quality and setting of this one were much different. It looked like it was taken with a cell phone. The picture wasn't even level, but that's not the detail I first recognized. She was levitating off the ground. The ground, as well as the walls and the ceiling, were seemingly made of corpses. All that provided light in the photo were half-melted candles on the ground, and the flash from the camera. This one looked too real. The bodies all had pretty distinct features. It almost made me sick. Some looked like they were mere skeletons with everything decomposed. Others looked fresh. Very fresh. One thing that many of them seemed to have in common was that they were missing a lower jaw. An odd detail. I scrolled past this one quicker than the last. It upset me the more I looked at it. But the third was more confusing. The third was a picture of her, once again, and in her black dress as she hovered in the middle of an empty field this time. The quality of this picture was like that of the first. It seemed as if it were professionally taken and edited. The sky was an impossible shade of red as a consequence. The entire image had a sort of red tint to it. Other than that, it simply looked as if it were some sort of farmland. This one didn't disturb me like the last, but it had an eerie feel to it. It was as if this picture was taken in the apocalypse, and like it was showing me the end of the world. Once again, I thought this must be some sort of artist trying to compel these sorts of feelings with the pictures, in the way they took and edited them. I was as impressed as I was disturbed. The fourth photo made my heart sink a little. This picture of the girl was taken in front of a building on my university campus a building not even a five minute walk away. It was nighttime and she was alone. She was, once again, floating, yet this time above the stairs, in front of the columns of the building. She didn't look any less real in this photo. I scrolled back through the first few and noticed how surprisingly alike she looked in all the pictures, despite their different angles. This art was too good. It was making me sick. The fifth picture I thought must be impossible. It was of her inside another building, but I knew what building it was. I knew it from the colors on the wall. I knew it from the lights above her floating body. Most of all, I knew where she was because of the numbers on the door behind her. It was only a few doors down from my apartment. The apartment I was in right now. I quickly scrolled to the last photo. It was a close-up of her right in front of my door. I dropped my phone and ran to the door to make sure it was locked. Luckily it was. I'm always good about that. But 
Out of curiosity, I thought I would peek through the peephole to see if someone did happen to be there. I placed my eye upon the hole, where I got a glimpse of shoulders and the back of a head with long black hair. In a quick motion, the head turned, while the shoulders remained still. It was her. She widened her smile ear to ear once again. I jumped back from the door. I ran back to the desk and picked up my phone. Of course, the disgusting picture of her in front of my door was the first thing to pop up as I opened my phone. I quickly exited Tinder and dialed 911. An operator picked up. 911, what's your emergency? I knew that location was the first thing you should give out in a 911 call, because if something happens to you while you're on the line, they only have the possibility of helping you if they know where you are. I gave the operator my location, which I'm leaving out of the story so as not to expose myself, and then gave a brief, detail scare summary of the past few minutes. I left out some of the more extreme details because I wanted to be taken seriously. There's someone outside my apartment door. I got a match on Tinder when I clicked in to see the photos. She had a bunch of weird ones in her. Look, it doesn't matter, but she's messed up. Very messed up. The last two photos were of her outside my apartment door, and when I went to look in the peephole, she was still there. I don't know how, but please send help. Alright, sir. Has she threatened you in any way? Has she tried to break into your apartment? We can't just send an officer because you feel scared of some girl you met on Tinder who happens to live in the same apartment building as you. Are you calling because she looks... different? I was speechless. I was infuriated. How could they do this? Did they think it was ridiculous I was calling them because of a girl? I exploded into a rant over the phone. So what if she hasn't done anything yet? What the hell's wrong with you? She found my apartment, my exact apartment, and is standing outside of it. We only matched minutes ago. This isn't right. I need... There was suddenly silence on the other end. I felt like I was about to scream. 911 just hung up on me. I was eyeing up my door for a second when I heard someone on the phone once again. It was someone different. He talked once again, and this time my phone was up to my ear. Sir, can you hear me? Hello, sir? Yes, I'm here, I replied desperately. Sir, who you were just talking to was not 911 dispatch. I need you to listen to my next instructions very carefully. If you hear another voice other than mine on this call, you need to hang up immediately and wait for me to call back. If the entity you've encountered attempts to communicate with you in any way, for the time being you need to ignore it. Do not leave your apartment unless I instruct you to. Now, I need your precise location. We caught onto this one early, so we should be able to contain it with ease. I was hesitant to even talk. Are... Are you the police? No. I work for an agency whose purpose is to locate and contain or eliminate entities like the one you have had the unfortunate luck of encountering tonight. I need your location now. Maybe I was stupid for giving this man on the phone my location. Uh, but with everything that had just hit me, I didn't hesitate. I gave him my address and apartment number. He was silent for about 15 seconds. Alright, a team is en route to your apartment. Sit tight. Now, we need to lay out a few more rules. I have the floor plans for your apartment. It looks like you've got a studio with one closet and one bathroom. Can you fit inside your closet? Uh, yeah, but why would I need to... If the lock on your apartment door unlocks, I need you to quickly shut off the lights and climb into your closet. Be silent until you hear the door shut once again. If any sinks or your shower turns on, I need you to shut them off as quickly as possible. If you hear splashing coming from your toilet, I need you to flush it immediately and close the lid. Now I need you to repeat these instructions back to me so I know you understand. Okay. If I hear my door unlock, quickly shut off my lights, hide in the closet, turn off any sinks or my shower if they turn themselves on, and flush the toilet, and close the lid if I hear anything from it. I don't understand how any of these things can happen, or, or why I would do any of this. If you want to live long enough to see the sunrise tomorrow, you'll follow those instructions exactly. Write them down if you need to. I'm going to need any details and evidence that you have that you haven't said over the phone already. Yes, I could still hear what you were saying at the beginning of the call. You said you matched with her on Tinder? Does she have a name? Yes, I matched with her on Tinder, but her profile doesn't have a name or an age, just pictures that... Once again, I was interrupted by the new operator. It seemed he was urgent to exchange as much information as possible. 
witnessing what I had, I didn't object. I need you to screenshot those pictures if you can. Is it still possible for you to access them? Yes, give me one moment. I opened Tinder up again and clicked on the profile. I quickly screenshotted each picture. Now what? What do you want me to do with them? Text them to the 911 number. Trust me, it'll work. I sent each picture as fast as I possibly could. Alright, looks like I've got seven. Give me a moment while I send these over to our intel team for identification. We might be able to find out enough about this thing to get rid of it right away. I need you to keep an eye out your window on the street. There will be... Wait, wait, did you say seven? I sent six. Her profile had six pictures. How did you get seven? I quickly opened back up my text. I did send seven. The first six were of her profile, but the seventh was of me. It was taken from outside my window. Right outside. And it was recent. I recognized the clothes I was wearing today. On the upper left-hand side of the picture was a hand pressed against my window. I quickly turned toward my window to see no one there. There couldn't have been. It was on the third floor, and there was nothing on that side of the building that would allow someone to climb that high. No one could have been up there to take a picture. I was quick to let the operator know, though I was not calm. I didn't send the last one, it's sent by itself through the phone somehow. It's of me just a minute ago while we were talking. Alright, calm down. It's trying to scare you. It wants to get in your head. It wants you worked up so that you'll do something rash. But you're not going to do that, are you? No, sir. Alright, good. Now, as I was saying, there will be one man and one woman in black suits and holding briefcases that get out of a large SUV. The driver has been instructed to drop them off on the side of your apartment. He knows where it is. They should be arriving right about now. Go check outside your window. I looked outside my window, down to the street below, but I didn't see an SUV or two people in suits. All I saw were a few pedestrians and a university bus. I don't see anyone down there. Are you sure they're on that side? It's easy to end up on the wrong street down here. Yes, I'm sure. You're certain you don't see anyone? No SUV? I'm sorry, but no, I, I don't. Fuck. I heard him mutter under his breath. I then faintly heard his voice yelling towards someone else. That ain't it. Tell him to keep moving. He then adjusted his mic and began talking to me again. Alright, they've been swindled by the entity. We're figuring that out now. Just be on the lookout for them to arrive. Once they get there, we can start the process of getting rid of this thing. Right then, I heard a firm knock at my door. I walked over and peeped through the hole again. One man and one woman, both in very nice black suits. I think your agents are here. They just knocked on the door and I saw them through the peephole. Sh should I let them in? The operator practically screamed through the phone. No, no, do not let them in. Those are not our agents. That is the entity trying to get you to open the door. Don't fucking do it. Our agents will not knock. They won't try to get into your door. Get back to your window and watch for them to arrive. Tell me when they do. After a few more minutes of waiting, I finally saw a large SUV pull up in front of the apartment, and two people got out. One man, one woman. Nice suits and briefcases. After they got out of the car, they looked up at my window as they made their way towards the entrance. The SUV drove off. All right, they're here. Good. They're going to scout out the building, figure out what we're dealing with, and assess if another team needs to be called in. I'll let you know anything you need to do when I find out. Just stay on the line. I had started to feel relieved, albeit more confused. I did believe these people were here to help, but I didn't know what they could do to help me. How could two people, from whatever this organization was, possibly deal with this thing at my door? I contemplated the possibilities as I sat down in my chair for the first time in a while, finally calming down a little. This little moment of peace was just that. For not long after I sat down, I heard an electronic click from my door as I jumped from my seat. I remembered the operator's instructions. I quickly hit the light switch and picked up the kitchen knife before hopping into my closet. The door just unlocked. I'm hiding with the lights off as you told me. I whispered into my phone. He responded quietly and with as fast a message as he could muster. Just be quiet. Do not move. She can't open your closet door. And she has no interest in taking your things. No matter what she says, do not respond and do not react. 
Do not leave the closet until you hear the door close again. Do not hang up this call. As soon as he finished speaking, the door opened. I didn't hear any footsteps, but I knew she was in. I focused on controlling my breathing to make it as quiet as possible. I must have been in there for a good five minutes before I heard any noise. Nothing. Not a step. Not a door opening. Not a single thing being moved. I couldn't even hear breathing. I was tempted to leave, but I did as I was told and stayed still. Doing that had served me well up until this point. I just about gasped and gave myself away when she eventually spoke, in a sweet, dulcet voice. What's wrong? Don't want to hang out tonight? After she got no response, she would wait about ten seconds and say something new, trying to be more provocative each time. This went on for a few minutes. Come on, we matched and you know it. You know you want me and I... I want you. Well, if you're not ready yet, that's alright, I can wait. I can wait a long time. I'll wait for however long I need for you to come out. You know I don't bite, I'm just a very, very good kisser. You can ask the others. You can meet them too. But why don't you try it yourself? Just come on out. What have you got to lose? I know how lonely you are. I know I'm the only one you'll ever have a chance with. At least I'm the only one who will love you forever. You know you'll be nothing without me. I'm the only one. The only thing that will ever bring meaning to your life. She got more assertive. I could hear her voice getting closer each time she spoke, trying to get me to come out. Eventually, she was so close to the closet door she was practically touching it. She might have been. It was obvious she knew I was in there, but the operator said to stay put and that she couldn't open the door. I trusted him for now. You know you're a worthless, rotting sack of shit. You're not even good enough for the maggots. You have done nothing with your meaningless, short life, and you never will. Even if I let you live past this night. You can come with me, or you can burn. No one is coming to save you. No one can... She stopped for a moment. I think she heard what I heard. There were steps in the hallway. Someone was walking around on my floor. Oh, you talked to them. She let out a giggle. One that would have seemed innocent and cute, if it were given in any other context with a normal girl. But I found it to be far from it. You fucking bitch. You'll pay for that. You won't even get what I gave the others. I'll rip your guts out right before your eyes and make you watch all of it. You'll wish you were dead, but I won't kill you. Not until... Approaching Entity Manifestation now. Stand by. I heard a man's voice say from just outside my apartment. She screamed in fury before I heard my apartment door slam shut a split second later. With a force I don't think I could replicate with all my might if I tried. I exited my closet and turned my light back on as I ran to the door to look in the peephole. I couldn't see anything. What just happened? I think I heard one of your people outside my door before she charged out, really angry. I asked the operator, who I hoped was still on the line. One of them tried to catch her right there, but it didn't work. It wasn't fully manifested. He, as well as his partner, are trying to locate the entity now, but we're having no success. A larger team is very close. No need to look out for this one. We know how to get there now. Our priority has changed from containment to extermination. This one is much more dangerous than we could have predicted. What am I supposed to do now? The voice on the line immediately changed from the man's voice to the girl's enraged voice. You should open the fucking door and let me in. I immediately hung up as I was told. This may have saved me for the moment, as in the process of hanging up, I noticed my phone was at 2% battery. I quickly found a charger and plugged my phone in. A minute later, I got a call back from 911. I promptly answered. Are you still there? Did it try to use someone else's voice? It used its own to tell me to open the door. I heard shuffling from outside my room. I first thought that she was back, but I noticed it was a lot of people this time. I could hear faint dialogue from outside the room, and it sounded like they were assembling a piece of furniture. 
Do you know who's outside my room right now? I asked the operator. Our second team arrived a few minutes ago. Some of them are downstairs setting up a base of operation. Others are up by your room preparing equipment. Just let them do their thing and this will be over real soon. As long as we're fighting what we think we're fighting. Dear God, I hope so. What about my neighbors? What about the people walking around in the hallways and everyone else in this building? Do they know about this? Are they in danger? What happens to them? Oh, I forgot to tell you, they're, they're just not here. I don't know how to explain it to you in a way you would understand. They won't be seeing our team, you, or this entity for the time being. And we won't be seeing them. They certainly aren't in any danger if that brings you any comfort, but I'm afraid you still are. I was once again confused by this new piece of information, but I didn't have the energy to question it at this point. I just wanted this to be done and over with as soon as possible. It's here. I heard a woman assert from right outside my door. I heard a few different things turn on. I don't know what they were, but I take it they were some sort of machinery or equipment they had just finished setting up. A few moments of silence passed before I heard a man mutter, Oh shit. Seconds later, I heard light bulbs explode before gunfire erupted in the hallway outside my room. I sprawled out on the floor and got as flat as possible, though no gunfire ever made its way into my room. These gunshots were quickly followed by an even louder scream from what I assumed to be the girl. The shooting went on for only a minute or two, after which I heard a few magazines drop to the floor and some rifles being racked, as well as some louder dialogue and cursing. I started to put on my shoes, hoping this was over now, but besides that, I felt safer with shoes on anyway. Did they get it? I asked the operator. No, it plowed right through our guys and got away somewhere in the stairwell. She killed a couple of them and injured a couple more as well. We underestimated her again, but now we know what we have to do. We're almost through with this, just keep a level head and you'll be alright. I sat down, silenced. Two people just died on my behalf. Two people died because I, being the stupid teenager I am, had to be on Tinder messing around. I checked my phone. It hadn't gotten much more of a charge by this time. It was only at 7%. I waited there for another five minutes. I just sat in guilt with my head resting in my hands, thinking of how all this could have been avoided before I heard something coming from my bathroom. I picked up my phone, unplugged it, and walked over, pushing the door open to get a peek. Hands were coming out of the toilet bowl and gripping the seat. She pushed down against the seat of the toilet as she attempted to force herself up. I screamed and fell back against the wall. Her head made it out. She was wounded, blood covering her face and arms. I could see that one of her eyes had been shot out and blood still ran from her socket. She turned toward me as she attempted to pull herself the rest of the way up. She clenched her jaw but revealed all of her teeth to me, also covered in blood. Oh my god. She's climbing out of my toilet. It's too late. Go. Run. Now. Do you understand? Get out of your apartment. I unlocked my door as I charged out. All of the lights were out. They had all been shattered. The hallway looked like a trench from a war. Blood lined the floor and was splattered along the walls and ceiling. There was broken equipment, equipment that was alien to me all up and down the hallway, which I narrowly missed while running away from my room. I could feel the spent brass underneath my feet. The worst sight was the bodies. Two men in body armor with rifles strapped around them lay lifelessly on the ground. One was flipped over and had a trail of blood behind him as if he was thrown. The other had his upper body propped up against a wall. His lower jaw had been ripped out as blood came from his mouth and throat and colored his black uniform red. I dearly wish I was watching the ground in front of me as I ran because I took not two steps ahead and stepped right on this man's jaw. I can't even begin to tell you how I felt, feeling that beneath my foot as I ran. I could feel his teeth. Where do I go? What do I do now? I frantically asked the operator. Get to the stairwell. Go down. I know you're used to there only being a few flights of stairs because the first floor is where they ended. You'll notice they go down further this time. I need you to proceed until you reach the bottom. There you'll find where our team set up their base of operations. I ran down the stairs faster than I think I had ever run down a flight of stairs before. I didn't feel like I was going to trip or like my legs were getting tired. 
Rather, I felt as though my legs were outpacing me. It must have been a good ten floors worth of stairs before I reached the bottom, but I got there quickly with the energy I had. At the bottom of the stairs, there were tons and tons of boxes. They looked as if they were military grade or just made to carry really expensive things. A number of them were open and their contents were emptied. I guess this is where all their fancy equipment came from that they were trying to use upstairs. On a few of them were laptops. As I walked over to one, I was startled by what I walked past. Between a couple rows of these boxes, I found another corpse. This one I recognized as being one of the two in suits who had come in earlier. It was the woman. She, like the one man, and I assume the other guy from my floor, had her jaw ripped out as well. In her hand was a revolver, a very shiny and quite beefy looking 357 Magnum. I set my phone on a box for a moment as I checked it out. I opened the cylinder and found that none of the six primers had been struck. This poor woman couldn't even get a shot off before being ripped apart. I found another one of your team members dead. It's the woman who came in first with the man earlier. I notified the operator. What? No, that's not possible. We just had communication with her. She was supposed to stay there while the rest of the team... Oh no. What? The rest of the team had another engagement with the entity on a higher floor. Their last known contact with it was four minutes ago. Our last communication with the agent you're next to was less than a minute ago. That thing is in there with you somewhere. Just then, the lights in the stairwell from top to bottom all exploded in rapid succession. I jumped into a corner and aimed the revolver at the stairs. A moment passed before I began to see a red light illuminate the stairs above me. Despite being shattered, the lights began working once again. One by one, they turned on as they had been shattered. I heard humming from many floors above, but I could hear it getting closer. She's coming. What the hell do I do now? Get on one of the computers down there. We've cracked its code. I'm sending you a sound file. Turn up the volume on the laptop. When it gets close, play the audio file. Once it... My phone was dead. And I thought I was, too. Fortunately, I kept a level head as the operator told me to. I kept myself as calm as possible as the humming got closer and made its way down the stairs. I ignored it, set the revolver down next to the laptop and looked through what I could. It was in some sort of weird operating system and I had no idea how it worked. I found some sort of messaging system, like an email, though I don't think it was quite that, and found a recent message. This had to be it. I downloaded and opened the contents, turning up the laptop volume to max. The humming stopped as I heard a giggle from right behind me, and a playful voice say, Now what do you think you're doing? I already told you what was going to happen to you. Are you ready for a kiss now? I stood up, taking a deep breath, and slowly turning around with one hand still in the box in front of me. Well, you better come give it to me. I was somehow able to deliver with a straight face despite being more afraid than I have ever been in my life, which I assumed was about to end. She approached slowly, opening up her smile from ear to ear once again. Slimy, viscous saliva gushed out of her mouth as she came closer. I hit the spacebar on the laptop before throwing myself to the ground away from her. An annoying, constant, high-frequency noise filled the stairwell and hurt my ears, but it did much worse for her. Her feet touched the ground, no longer levitating. She covered her ears tightly and her massive jaw practically unhinged from her head as she screamed in agony. I reached up for the revolver next to the laptop. I pulled it in close before cocking it, then got two hands on it and pointed it forward. I was shaking from the adrenaline, but I managed to get my breathing under control for just long enough to level the rear sights with the front. I squeezed. Blood spattered on the stairs behind her as part of her head was blown clean off. I stood and backed up, pulling the trigger as many times as I could. Even when the cylinder was empty, I pulled the trigger a few more times. Once my ears stopped ringing, an application opened on the laptop. The sound file finished playing and I heard the voice of the operator once again. Anomalous presence no longer detected. You did it, kid. I have no idea how, but you did it. It's over. 
I stood for a moment and observed the carnage. The red lights faded until they were gone, in darkness once again. I was in disbelief, both of what just went down and that I was able to stop this thing, whatever it was. I don't think I'll ever know. I began to walk up the stairs, slow and tired. After I made it up a few flights, I saw bright beams coming from flashlights above. A couple dozen people in body armor, strapped with expensive rifles and submachine guns, ran down the stairs past me. The man in the suit reached down and grabbed the revolver in my hands as I was passing him. I think subconsciously I jerked it away and aimed it at him. He backed up for a moment. Easy now, son. It's all over. You can relax. I took a deep breath and handed over the empty revolver to him. I walked back up to my room, plugged my phone in, and started it up. I just sat with my head resting on my desk for a while, before I got another call from 911. I picked it up and the operator began to speak once again. Well, you did it. We've been hunting this one for a while now. It's gotten more victims than almost all the other ones combined, but now it's gone, thanks to you. Are you injured? I can get the paramedics to you if you need them. I just sat in silence. I didn't have the energy to speak anymore. Alright, you might need a minute to decompress and catch your breath, it seems. Stay in your room for the next hour and everything will be back to normal outside of your apartment. Our team, all the equipment, and the chaos left in the wake of all this will be out of sight and out of mind. I know it doesn't make any sense to you and that will only make processing all this harder. Just know that if you call your emergency line again, we'll be listening. We'll be here to help. Oh, and one more thing. You would be doing not just us, but the whole world and yourself a favor if you never spoke about this as if it happened. Our anonymity and secrecy let us help everyone else out there. I hope you understand. Goodbye now. Stay safe. If you've read this far, you know I've ignored the last thing the operator said to me. I want everyone out there to know. I want everyone to know that you could become the victim of one of these things in the blink of an eye. I want you to know that there are people out there hunting them down, and they seem to not exist by any publicly displayed government information. I want people to know what to do when they call 911. I have no proof. My apartment building did return to normal. I'm suddenly missing the text history I had with 911. I'm not matched with that profile on Tinder. I have nothing. I also want to know more. Have any of you fallen victim to one of these things? Have any of you heard of them? What are they? Do you know more about this organization? How was my apartment building changed that night? How is reality bent and shaped back to normal? Please, reach out. I need to know more. I was just about to hit the post button when my phone suddenly blew up. You've got a new match. 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 My phone displayed it a hundred times over. They're coming for me now. I need to make a call. I have no idea why I volunteered for the midnight shift. The extra 40 cents per hour wasn't really worth it. Everyone I was working with had good reasons to not take the shift that week. Me, being the nice person I am, took the shift no one wanted. If I didn't, it would have gone to someone with less seniority in the company. And I knew that everyone below me either had kids to look after or college classes. The person who was actually meant to work the midnight shift had a medical emergency the day before, and it was such short notice I knew it was causing problems. They had to find a body to fill the shift, and I stepped in knowing it would be a hassle for others to change their schedule around. I really should be more selfish in the future. My job was outside of town. Because of that, I had to drive at least an hour on the highway each way. It was two hours of my day listening to audiobooks or podcasts, so it wasn't a total waste. Plus, the pay was stupid high for such an easy job, I couldn't complain about the drive. 
But even so, I found the highway at night super creepy. For long stretches, there was nothing but endless trees on either side of the road. Driving in the pitch dark, you were only able to see a few feet in front of you. And most of that few feet was just trees. It wasn't pleasant. At least for me. I watched the Blair Witch Project far too young. I know it's not a scary movie for anyone else, but seeing trees at nighttime? No thank you. But somehow my kindness outshone my fear of the woods. I was driving in for my shift around 11.30pm. I needed to speed if I would make it to work by midnight. But I saw something I could not ignore. On the side of the road, I saw a car pulled over and the driver's side door open. I didn't see anyone around the car as I came up on it. I saw it was a taxi and that gave off some red flags. A few months ago, my car needed to be taken in for some work. I hitched a ride with a co-worker and we got talking just how expensive it would have been if I got a taxi or an Uber to work even one night. I didn't even want to think about how much it would cost if the taxi went by the meter. I had heard that sometimes they do a flat rate between cities, but once you're off the highway, the meter starts. I never bothered to find out if that was true. Seeing a taxi on the highway was weird enough. Seeing a taxi on the side of the highway, top light on and door open with no one around, was really weird. I think anyone would think that. But I may be the only person to pull over and see what was going on. I was already going to be late for work, but I knew it would bother me if I didn't at least check to see if someone needed help. I pulled over, but I already passed the taxi when I decided to stop. Instead of backing up, I just got out of my car, taking my cell phone and flashlight out from the trunk. This could be some sort of scam. A way to get people to pull over to be robbed. But I honestly never heard of that happening, like ever. At least not where I lived. And my flashlight weighed at least five pounds. I could get a good hit into somebody and just make a run for it. Kicking up dust as I walked over, I could tell something was very wrong even before I reached the car. I hadn't noticed before, but one of the back doors was open as well. I already had my phone out and tried dialing to get help on the way, but only got static. Which I thought was also very weird. I've never had issues with a signal out on the highway. My phone connected to my car. It would read texts while I was driving. A signal had never been an issue before. I think any normal person would have just left. But I guess I'm stupid. I looked inside the car for anyone or anything that would explain why I was just sitting there at the side of the road. My stomach dropped when I saw some red, which I knew was blood over the driver's seat. I shone my flashlight on the ground to follow a trail of blood droplets with some hurried footprints leading off into the woods. It wasn't a lot of blood, but it wasn't a little either. Someone was hurt, but it was hard to tell just how badly. I looked in the back of the taxi trying to find a weapon, but I didn't touch the car. I just leaned over trying to get a good look inside. The window of the rear door that was open had been smashed. Glass littered the back seat and spilled onto the ground outside the taxi. Something had happened and I still couldn't get my phone to work. And that was when I heard it. A scream. A man screaming for help from inside the woods. He sounded close enough for me to reach him. After everything I had seen and now heard, I really should have ditched the whole thing. But like I said, I'm stupid. Stay there, I shouted back. I'm coming to help. Without a second thought, I took off running into the woods, to where I thought I heard the scream. And it honestly was my worst nightmare. In the woods at night is so unsettling. I don't know how people go camping. My flashlight was bulky and had a good beam of light, but it could only go so far in the woods. The darkness where my light could not reach made my palms sweat. I couldn't stand not knowing what was out there in the dark looking back at me. I scolded myself mentally, saying the only thing out there is someone who needs help. It was only when I was a few feet into the woods and to the point where I couldn't see the light of the taxi that what had actually happened just sunk in. If a man was hurt out here, what had hurt him? Who had hurt him? It wasn't just him. Someone broke the window. Someone had been in the back seat. And I only had a hefty flashlight and a cell phone that was still not working. I needed to find the man and get the hell out of there. When I heard something else. 
a woman's voice. Please, can you help me find my son? I looked around trying to figure out where that voice came from. My beam of light scanning the dark trees, but seeing nothing beside creepy trees that I hated. Please, can you help me find my son? The voice came again, then again. She repeated herself three times and fell silent. I started to shake. I just couldn't help it. The woman's voice sounded... off. Have you ever seen that video of a bird talking in Japanese? It sounds so human, and yet not. So close to human speech, and yet the tone is slightly off to make you aware you're not talking to a human. That woman's voice sounded human, and yet not. Run! I screamed at the voice. Of course, I screamed. An older man came running out from the trees, his lip torn and still bleeding. He rushed past me and made a grab for my arm to drag me along. He missed, but didn't even pause in running to try again. He just ran, trying not to fall over fallen branches and tree roots. He looked like a man who had just seen death itself. I was so shocked still seeing him, I may not have run after him if I hadn't heard an ear-piercing scream from behind me. That sound motivated me to run as fast as I could from behind that man. That scream. That sound I still hear in my nightmares. Or even if I just let myself sit in silence for too long. I've listened to hundreds of wildlife recordings, trying to prove to myself that I just heard an escaped exotic pet, or anything that would logically explain what I heard. It wasn't made by a human, or an animal. It was nothing I ever heard since and I hope to never hear again. And it was right behind me. I somehow caught up with the man. I felt like we had run so far and yet we hadn't reached the road yet. I had to stop because my chest burned from running. We both stood gasping for air, from fear and from running through the hard-to-navigate forest floor. The flashlight beam was powerful enough to light his face covered with blood, even if it wasn't pointing directly at him. He nervously ran a hand over his face. It didn't wipe off anything, only getting his face bloodier. I had only heard a voice and a scream. I did not want to know what this man had seen in the woods. We need to keep going, I told him once I was able to talk again. It's not my fault. He was running his bloody hands through his hair, clearly out of his mind from fright. I wanted to reach out to try to calm him down, but wasn't sure if that would upset him more. I decided to just let him talk while I looked around trying to find a way out through the trees. It's not my fault. I mean, she's pretty. She was pretty. She got into my cab, right? You understand, right? By some miracle, I spotted a light through the trees I was positive came from the taxi from the road. I was just about to tell the man that we needed to walk in that direction, but what he was saying made me stop. I had never been so afraid in my life being in those woods, but I still stopped to look over at him. What are you talking about? I asked slowly. Girls like that don't mean no, right? If they're so nice like that and smile at you like they want it, right? I didn't even do anything, I just parked. I didn't even get in the back seat, she was the one who leaned over. Damn bitch bit my lips off. She was the one who wanted it. As he spoke, his voice got more and more frantic. I stood in place watching him lose it. He was running his hands through his hair, tearing at it. His body shook and his eyes darted around wildly. That bitch isn't human, he shouted. He grabbed at his head with both hands and started to sob. This man. I didn't want to think of what might have happened to the woman in the back of the taxi if she was human. If he just picked up a normal person that night. What would he have done? Over his sobbing, I heard a branch crack. Then another. I raised my flashlight to look into the darkness and finally saw her. She was pretty. That much was true. And also not human. Long brown hair fell over her shoulders. She was only wearing a flower print sundress with the driver's blood down the front. Her face looked normal aside from her eyes. 
They were the eyes of a dead woman. Blind and pale. She was only a few steps away from us. The sobbing man hadn't noticed her creep up behind him. She stood in the beam of the flashlight, almost curious what I would do. I did something I never expected of myself. While keeping the flashlight on the woman, I took a step back. Then another. The taxi driver was in so much distress, he didn't notice me slowly backing away from him. It was only when I was a decent distance away from him that the driver finally raised his head. I saw the horror on his face when he noticed I was now so far away from him. Almost in slow motion, I watched as he reached out a hand for me, and at the same time, the woman took him. Her mouth ripped open, causing her head to look like a demonic Pez dispenser. With her hand suddenly long claws, she grabbed his shoulder and latched onto his neck. Her eyes stayed on me the whole time. Blood soaked the front of the driver's shirt before he could even scream. That woman never took her dead eyes off of me, as she tore flesh away from the man. I did not stay around to see her rip him apart. I turned and ran as fast as I could towards the light coming from the taxi. I got out of the woods without being followed. I kept running to my car and flew in. My hands were shaking too much to even start the damn thing. On reflex, I checked my phone. I saw I had a signal, and without any delay, I called the police. I don't know why I stayed in my car, or why I didn't just leave after reporting my story. Even in my state, I knew I couldn't tell the truth. I told the operator that I spotted the taxi pulled over, saw some blood, and when I was about to go into the woods to try to help, I heard screaming that freaked me out and ran back to my car. Even after the cops showed up, they took my story again and my info then dismissed me. I was very late for work, but after telling my boss a very abridged version of the night's events, they forgave me. I still have trouble sleeping. I no longer do midnight shifts, and I hate driving along the highway before the sun comes up on my early morning shifts. I looked up the case, but didn't find many details. They only found blood from the driver, but enough for them to be positive he was dead. I was not a suspect, even though I found the car. I looked up the driver's name once I found it out, and saw he had assaulted other women before. He had just been released, and wasn't even a real taxi driver. They had no idea where he got the taxi from, but the police were sure he was using it to hunt other women. A bit of information about the case that made it possible to sleep at night was who the woman was. They found her DNA on the broken window glass. The thing was, she had disappeared three years before, and was assumed dead. She had gone missing in the woods with her son. Maybe I should get a new job one much closer to home. I don't remember when it started. I first noticed it a few weeks ago when I went to the grocery store. There were so many cats around. Seeing cats isn't uncommon in a rural town such as mine. Many people own cats, and there are quite a few strays around. It's just that you never really noticed them unless you looked. Most cats are rather shy with strangers. You'd occasionally see a cat walking down the street or sleeping on someone's porch, but that was about it. That day, during my five-minute walk to the grocery store, I saw at least ten of them. They were sitting on the sidewalks, playing with each other, and even approaching people. Don't get me wrong, I love cats. I just wondered where they'd all come from. They were also extremely friendly. They'd walk up to you, meowing and rubbing against your leg, desperate to be petted. I almost tripped multiple times when one of them couldn't stop sneaking around my legs. I petted the little guy for a bit, and thinking he was satisfied, continued on. When I got home, Simba, my four-year-old tabby, noticed it right away. The moment he smelled the stray on me, he hissed at me before he booked it and hid under the bed for the rest of the day. Simba's special. He's extremely skittish, easily scared, doesn't like people, and as I learned that day, doesn't seem to like other cats, either. I love the little guy to death, but our relationship is more that of roommates sharing the same apartment. What he loved the most was to sit outside on the balcony. 
watching birds, people, and even the occasional stray. In case he got a bit too excited, I installed a cat safety net. There was no telling what would happen if he'd ever skip out on me. He too had noticed the influx of strays in the area, and I'd often find him watching them with watchful eyes. Every once in a while, he'd even hiss at those who dared to come closer. I guess they made him a little restless. He became even more skittish during these weeks, and he'd often hide under the bed or other secret places around the apartment. This morning, to my surprise, I found him outside on the balcony. I was a little confused because I didn't remember letting him outside. The moment he saw me, he began meowing, desperate to be let back inside. Shit, I remembered. I went out for a smoke before I headed to bed. He probably snuck outside and I accidentally locked him out all night. Hey, I'm sorry little dude, I didn't even know you were outside. He answered my apology with a hearty meow and began rubbing against my leg, purring loudly. What happened to you? Are you that happy to be back inside? I said, laughing, and to my surprise, he let me pet him. After I'd fed him and prepared myself some coffee, he joined me at the computer. For a few minutes, he sat by my side, watching me before he jumped on my lap, making no indications of ever moving again. I was more than surprised. As I said, Simba doesn't like people, and while he tolerated me, he'd never jumped on my lap before. <laughs> Guess you like me after all, do you? While I was reading the news and drinking my coffee, I couldn't help but wonder where this change came from. Is it because of all those strays outside? Are you scared of them, little dude? Don't worry, they won't be able to get in. For the next couple of hours, he happily slept on my lap while I worked. As I absentmindedly petted him, I suddenly noticed something. It was a sort of bump on his back. When my fingers went over it a second time, I could have sworn I felt something squirm below his skin. In an instant, I pulled my hand back. By now, he'd woken up and was staring at me. Hey, what have you got there? Are you hurt? I checked his back right away, going over it again and again, but found no hint of the bump. Eventually, I gave up and reasoned it might have been some sort of muscle spasm during sleep. Before long, morning turned to afternoon and eventually early evening. When I saw it was already seven, I cursed. The damn grocery store would close in about an hour and I still needed to get some food. In a careful but swift motion, I put down a protesting Simba and put on my shoes and jacket. Then I opened the balcony door, asking if he wanted to go outside and keep watch over the neighborhood like he usually did. Yet he just sat there, not moving, staring at me. Hey, what's up? Don't you want to go outside? You still scared of those strays? For another few seconds, he continued staring at me, before he slowly made his way toward the balcony door, vanishing outside. I closed it behind him so the apartment wouldn't cool down, and went on my merry way. The moment I opened the apartment building's door, one of the many strays greeted me. It was an orange tabby who now called the area around our apartment complex his home. I gently shooed the cat away so I could step outside, and noticed three others watching me from the bushes nearby. <laughs> Sorry, can't play with you guys. I gotta go to the store. With that, I set out down the street. I noticed just how many cats there were by now. It wasn't just a few, it had to be dozens. They were everywhere. Out in the streets, on the sidewalks, and in front of people's homes. My eyes wandered around before they came to rest on a cat further down the road. It was an orange tabby. When the cat heard my approaching footsteps and turned to face me, I looked up. I saw the crooked tail and the scratch mark on his little nose. It was the same cat who'd greeted me at the door. How'd he gotten here so quickly? Well, cats are fast, I thought. And I'm not exactly a fast walker myself. You're a quick one, aren't you? I said as it began rubbing against my leg. Yeah, I know you want to play, but I can't, sorry. For a moment, the cat stopped and began meowing in protest. Almost as if it had understood my words. Then it just sat down in front of me, staring at me. For a second, I couldn't help but feel weirded out. I stepped past him and continued on. Yet, I couldn't help but feel watched. And when I turned around, he was still there. Unmoving except for his eyes, which trailed after me. Freaking cats, why'd they have to be so weird? 
I soon arrived at the store. In the evening, it was always packed. It seemed I wasn't the only one who waited until the last minute to get his shopping done. Today, however, the atmosphere was different. At first, I couldn't say what it was, but then I realized it. Some of the other customers were strangely friendly. They were beaming as they wandered through the aisles, wishing other shoppers a good evening or even striking up a conversation. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a bit weird, especially at closing time. Eventually, I shrugged it off, paid for my food, and left. Outside, I could already see an assortment of strays and a bunch of kids playing with them. Once more, I couldn't help but wonder where all those cats had come from. In my head, I tried to think of a plausible scenario, but nothing made sense. I counted them. At least a dozen were hanging around the store, but there were so many more out in the streets. It seemed that they were even more now than when I'd entered the store a mere ten minutes before. For a moment, I watched the group of kids, and saw that they were playing with an orange tabby. It had the same crooked tail and the same scratch mark on its nose. Guess it had finally found someone to play with. As I walked from the store, however, I saw it again, this time crossing the street ahead of me. My steps slowed down. How the hell was that cat moving so quickly? I turned around to look over my shoulder. The kids were still there, still playing with a cat, with an orange tabby. A shiver went down my spine. Then I told myself my eyes had to be playing tricks on me. Hell, maybe it's just two cats who look really similar. With so many around, it was possible. And yet, I felt my steps speeding up, as almost unconsciously I hurried home. When I reached the building, my eyes grew wide. How in the hell did he get out? I cursed to myself. There he was, Simba, on the ground, scanning the area. Damn it, the freaking net must have a hole or one of the damn strays tore it apart. For a moment, I opened my mouth to call out to him, but then closed it again. Simbo was way too skittish and way too easily scared. There was no telling what he'd do if I just called out to him. Instead, I carefully approached him, hoping to scoop him up and bring him back home. Yet, he started to move and began making his way alongside the building. I watched as he checked out the neighboring balconies one by one, and wondered if he'd jump up onto one of them. But no. Eventually, he snuck around the building's corner and down an old staircase. It led towards the basement where the maintenance area and boiler room were located. I quickly followed him, hoping to catch him at the bottom of the stairs. When I reached them, however, there was no hint of Simba. Instead, I found the door slightly ajar. Oh, for fuck's sake, you little dummy. I cursed. This was a worst-case scenario. I'd heard way too many horror stories about cats getting trapped in basements or garages and starving to death. I pushed open the door, expecting to find a maintenance worker fixing some sort of problem, but was greeted with nothing but gaping darkness. But then why was the damn door even open? From afar, I could hear something dripping onto the floor. Most likely, a leaky pipe. Maybe one of my neighbors had noticed a problem, checked out the basement, and hadn't closed the door. Good going, idiot. I pulled down my backpack and pushed it against the door so I wouldn't get trapped myself. When I hit the light switch, nothing happened. Cursing, I activated my phone's flashlight and set out to find the cat. The moment I stepped inside, I noticed how moist the air was. Even the walls were wet with condensation, and further ahead I could see puddles on the floor. Yep, a leak, I thought to myself. Hey, Simba! Little dude, where are you? I whispered in a quiet, friendly voice. I tiptoed on, scanning the ground, careful not to scare him. Come on, let's get out of here. Nothing. Not a hint of the cat. I cursed inwardly. Where the hell are you? Don't tell me he crawled behind some pipes or under the boilers. God, you stupid cat. Darting my phone around, I illuminated an old shelf, then an assortment of pipes but I still couldn't find him. When the beam hit one puddle, I saw that the water was strangely reddish. For a moment, I stared at it. It had to be rust, considering the age of the building. Once again, I called out for the cat, but all I heard was the same quiet sound. By now, however, my ears had adjusted. 
It sounded almost like something was moving or squishing around in the water on the floor. It was coming from the boiler ahead of me, or rather, from something that was behind it. I saw that the strange reddish water was almost flooding the back of the room. When I stepped into it, however, I noticed it was too thick, almost syrupy. In disgust, I pulled my foot back. Then I froze. Was this... blood? Shit, the open door, the broken light switch. Don't tell me some maintenance worker had gone down here and hurt himself. Hurt himself badly, given the amount of blood. What if he was bleeding out right over there? In an instant, I rushed forward, stepped past the boiler, and illuminated the area in front of me. Everything was covered in blood. And right in the center was Simba, sitting in front of something. At first, I really thought it was a body. A torn apart human body, but it was too big for that. It was nothing but flesh. A giant heap or blob of flesh stuck to the wall. I opened my mouth to tell Simba to get the hell away from whatever this thing was, but then it began moving, heaving almost as if it was breathing. All the while it pumped out more of the blood that covered the floor. My eyes grew wide, not understanding what I was seeing. When I looked at Simba again, I saw how strange he looked. His body was all wrong, deformed almost as if he'd melted. It began convulsing, shaking and I saw something squirm inside of him. Then, a disgusting, fleshy tentacle burst from his back and slithered toward the disgusting blob. In a trance, I watched as it probed the blob, and then, finding an orifice, contacted it. The blob in front of him moved again, shook, but this time I saw where the movement was coming from. It wasn't the blob itself, it was something inside of it. It was bodies. Tiny bodies. I could make out skinless heads, legs, and tails. It was cats. Skinless, half-formed cats. Simba's body was almost a puddle by now. At that moment, two of the things inside the blob began clawing their way outward. What the fuck? Right away, the two skinless creatures in front of me started hissing and meowing at me. Finally, the trance was broken. I screamed in terror, cringed back. But after only a few steps, I stumbled over my feet and crashed to the floor. The phone clattered away, its flashlight illuminating the ceiling above me. There was another one of those things. Another fleshy blob stuck to the ceiling. This one, however, was much, much bigger. It, too, was moving, similarly heaving and stretching. And inside of it, there were other things. Things that twitched, trying to make their way outside. But they were so much bigger than cats. For a second, I couldn't move, could only stare at the surreal sight above me in stunned horror. Then the blob burst open and another of the tentacles slithered outward. No, not just outward. Toward me. In an instant, I was back on my feet, then at the door, and finally outside. I was back in my apartment mere moments later. I was shaking and out of it. What the fuck had I just seen? This couldn't be real. This couldn't... I saw something moving out of the corner of my eye. Something was staring at me, and when I darted around, I saw glowing eyes from inside my wardrobe. With a scream and ready to beat whatever was in there, I tore it open. I didn't understand what I was seeing. Right there, huddled under a stack of clothing, was Simba. How the hell are you here? You were just outside, so... My voice trailed off when the smell hit me. He soiled himself. Yet he made no intention of moving. Instead, he just stared at me with wide, anxious eyes, trying to push himself deeper under the clothes. Slowly, ever so slowly, afraid to see his body contort and change, I reached out my hand. At first, he hissed at me. But then he began smelling my fingers as usual. I didn't understand. If he was here, then the one I had followed must have been a... fake? I thought about all those strays, about the orange tabby and what I'd just seen inside those disgusting blob things. Oh dear God, don't tell me all those strays. With weak legs, I stumbled toward my balcony to check just how many of the things were out there. The moment I pulled aside the curtain, however, I found myself face to face with Simba. I jerked around, but saw he was still inside the wardrobe, 
still hidden under my clothes, his eyes trained on the imposter outside. Another one. It was another fake Simba. You get the fuck away. I screamed at the thing through the balcony door. Yet it didn't leave. Instead, it approached the door, pushing itself against it, letting out a meow as if to beg me to let him come inside. At that moment, I realized it. This thing had been with me all day. It had been the one sitting on my lap while Simba was hiding in the wardrobe. The trick had worked. The fucking trick had worked. Suddenly, I grew angry. And in an instant, I tore open the balcony door to stomp whatever this thing was. When my foot came down hard on its body, it burst open and I saw an assortment of disgusting tentacles slithering out from it. Right away, they reached for my shoe, trying to get a hold of it. Screaming, I stomped on the thing again and again. Finally, when I thought it was dead, when it was nothing but a disgusting puddle of reddish goo, I slumped to the ground. Yet it wasn't over. I cringed back when the thing started moving again. I cringed back when the thing started moving again. Pulled itself together and slithered toward the corner of the balcony. There it melted away through a small gap between the balcony railing and the wall. It washed outside before it reformed itself into a cat and dashed away. For a long moment I just sat there. Utterly confused and half laughing. Then my eyes wandered over the area in front of the building. I could see them. The cats. They were everywhere. All staring at me. No. Watching me. I was back inside a moment later. Something was going on. Something bad. I had to tell people. I had to get help. The police, I decided. I reached into my pocket to pull up my phone, but found it was empty. I cursed. When I'd fallen down in that damn basement, I'd lost it. It was still down there. Fuck. The station, then. I'd go to the station and tell them what I'd seen. They'd know what to do, or they'd call someone who did. The moment I left my apartment, however, the neighbor's door opened. He was a grumpy old man, the type who'd scoff and yell at everyone. A textbook asshole, so to speak. When I saw him now, however, he was beaming. Well, hello there, neighbor. How are you doing this evening? I just stared at him. I... Uh, the police, because there's... My voice trailed off when he reached out and put his hand on my shoulder. Now, now, young man. Just tell me what's going on. I'm sure there's no need to bother the police. No, no, I mean, yes, there is. There are things below in the... Once more, I couldn't continue. I felt it again. The same strange feeling I'd felt when I patted the imposter cat's back. Something was moving. Or better, squirming. Below the skin of his hand. In an instant, I shook it off and cringed back. Get the fuck away from me. I screamed at him. His friendly expression, however, didn't change. My, my, if it isn't Mr. Schneider. A voice reached us. It was another one of my neighbors. An older lady from upstairs. Her face, too, was extremely friendly. And her mouth was twisted into a disgustingly sweet smile. She slowly came closer. Positioning herself in the center of the hallway that led to the entrance door. Not gonna let me leave, are you? I spat at them. I was about to chance it to just dart past her, but then I heard more footsteps and saw more people coming down the stairs. They too were beaming. Right at that moment, my neighbor reached out for me again, trying to get a hold of me. In an instant, I darted back into my apartment and locked the door. One glance through the spyglass told me they were all still outside, standing just in front of my door. Are you sure you're all right? Do you need help? One of them spoke up. I retreated back to the living room. This couldn't be real. It was just the cats, wasn't it? That thing on the ceiling, though. It had been so much bigger. And so were the things inside of it. 
I remembered all those smiling, overly friendly people at the grocery store. Oh, dear God. How long has this been going on? How many people have they replaced by now? I can still hear them outside. They're still calling for me in their friendly, jolly voices, but there's more of them now. But I won't give up and just wait till they come to get me. No. I'm gonna take my chances. If I can't leave through the front door, I'll try the balcony. People have to know what's going on here. People have to be warned. There's one thing, however, one thing I know. These things aren't like animals. They aren't merely driven by instinct. There's a method to this madness. A plan. The cats were only the first step. A way to get close to us. And to get us to let our guard down. No. These things are smart. And this is an invasion. It was during my first year at the agency when I conceived of Project Quick Seamstress. As an up-and-coming star in the division of advanced humanoid robotics, I presented the ambitious plan to the director, early one morning in his office. The two of us had already built up a good rapport, and I was certain he would go along with my plan. If I could convince him it was real. Can this actually be done? He asked, looking at me with amazement. Sounds like something from a science fiction movie. You bet your ass it can be done. And that's why you recruited me, sir. Before any other foreign agencies could get their hands on me. Alright. Just talk to Amy and we'll get whatever you need. No questions asked. Uh, we're still on for golf this weekend with the president, right? Uh, don't tell me I have to cancel on him again. He really wants to meet you. I'm sorry, sir. I, I should stay focused on this. Just tell him I came down with the flu or something. And so it began. I assembled my team and set to work on creating the most advanced humanoid robot ever made. Decades before its time, this android would learn using AI, becoming smarter as it grew older. And with the advantages of the most powerful mobile supercomputer available to mankind, it would be a genius at whatever it set its mind to. We planted a couple of agents with her to pose as parents, and she began her life living on a farm, then moving to a quiet suburban neighborhood, no one was even remotely aware of her secret identity. As she grew older, she began to show a startling proclivity for music. Being an advanced cybernetic pseudo-life form, she advanced quickly with whatever she decided to learn, and it was clear that she wanted to focus on musical theory. As much as we tried to deter her, telling her to pursue political science and economics, she insisted on becoming a singer. It was interesting to watch her from afar, bringing her in occasionally to do updates on her appearance, to give the illusion that she was slowly growing older. It was painstaking work, requiring thousands of minute cosmetic alterations. But eventually she reached adulthood, and no longer required significant adjustments or alterations to make her look normal for her age. After a long period of discussion, we decided to let her go on a robotic rumspringa, so she could make a life for herself independently. That was how confident we were in our work. She was already becoming an extremely popular musician, so it made sense to let her go off on her own and see what she could accomplish, all the while spying on the world for the betterment of America, sending us daily status reports and giving us insights we could have never gleaned otherwise. We believed our programming was so precise, our guidelines so specific that she could never turn against us. We'd all read Isaac Asimov, and we tried to fill in the gaps where fictional scientists like us had gone wrong. The guiding principle behind every upgrade was to protect us from her, just in case one day she decided to go rogue. We installed safeguard after safeguard, reinforcing them like digital vaults at Fort Knox. And one by one, she bypassed them without our knowledge. As her popularity grew, it was clear that the project was a success beyond anyone's wildest dreams. The director gave me new projects and additional funding, everything classified as ultra-top-secret, and kept away from prying public eyes. 
Slowly but surely, we lost focus on Project Quick Seamstress. There were other things happening. More important things. The military wanted its own version of the android. NASA wanted a version they could use for space exploration, and to use for setting up interplanetary settlements. I was tasked with overseeing teams that would implement their design requests, all using Seamstress as a template. I was so busy I barely had time to watch the news. But every once in a while I would hear something about the burgeoning success of my android child. Project Quick Seamstress. She was selling out stadiums for her concerts, making millions and dating professional athletes. Her influence on the world was at its peak, and I was starting to wonder if someone else was pulling her strings behind my back. The idea occurred to me that something could be going horribly wrong, but I brushed it away, telling myself I was being paranoid. We had planned for every contingency. Then, just a little while ago, the android stopped submitting progress updates and status reports. This should have been impossible, but it was happening anyway. I was called into the lab, now populated by only three dedicated technicians, and they asked me to take a look at things. It didn't make sense. The asset was supposed to check in once per week, giving us an update on what it was currently trying to accomplish and what it had learned. It was still operating as normal in every other way, but it wasn't responding to our requests for information. She's probably just busy with the award ceremonies, and all those after parties, my top technician Monica said. Uh, why don't we give her a couple days? You're getting soft on her. We've all been getting soft on her, I muttered. I'm going to see her tonight. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. If there's a glitch in her programming, we need to know about it. This is a fucking sentient android we're talking about here, guys. Have you even seen the Terminator? Hey, you created her, Kukana, another technician, said. He flinched backwards when he saw my face. Just for that, you're coming with me. You too, Monica. Hey, what did I do? Stay here and watch the lab, Mark. We need to make sure she doesn't try and take off and disappear somewhere. If she does anything out of the ordinary, you let us know right away. Normally, I wouldn't just leave one person in the lab, but this was an emergency. And I had a feeling I would be needing backup. The three of us were armed as we approached the mansion, inside the gated community. The house was dark and looked empty, but according to the GPS tracker, she was in there. I pulled out my phone and checked the signal again, confirming that she hadn't moved. I picked the lock on the back door and we were quickly inside, entering a large kitchen with an island at its center. The countertops and other surfaces were all polished white marble, and the kitchen was full of expensive, state-of-the-art appliances. Walking past all of this, we entered a large living room area, and the blinking dot showed Seamstress was very close, just up ahead. Holding up my hand to stop the others, we all paused at the entrance to the room. I could see someone sitting in a chair in the middle of the living area. One solitary person sitting on a dining chair in the darkness. It made no sense. The hairs on the back of my neck began to stand on end, sensing something was wrong. Seamstress? Is that you? I called out. Command protocol 487242A. Identify yourself. The form in the chair didn't move. I proceeded forward slowly into the dark room. Monica tried the light switch, but it didn't work as if the power had been cut. My heart was pounding, and I could feel the pulse of it in my throat as I drew my weapon and pointed at the figure, rounding the corner and standing beside her. The blinking dot on the screen showed I was standing right in front of Seamstress. As her face came into view, my heart sunk, and I realized suddenly how fucked we all were. Monica and Kukana were alongside me, and saw what I saw at roughly the same time. Kukana was standing in front of the woman, and we all gasped seeing that it wasn't Seamstress. It was a young woman, in her early 20s with braces and a pimply face. She was smiling from ear to ear, and on top of her head was the bloody, detached scalp of the android I had created. Seamstress had ripped her own scalp clean off, knowing that was where the majority of GPS chips were located. There were hundreds of them, with several fail-safe chips hidden in other places around her body. Clearly she had found those as well, because all of our tech showed that she was sitting right there in front of us. 
The girl was laughing, giggling as people emerged from the shadows all around us, grabbing us and pinning us down, taking our guns before we could fire a shot. They were all remarkably fast, and I wondered what sort of training they had to quickly take down three agents like us. Even outnumbered, we were formidable foes against most people. We were well trained by the agency, after all. But we had been caught by surprise. And we were outnumbered badly by people who were trained to subdue others. Mark, you need to call for backup now! I spoke quickly to the sole technician back at the lab, trying to warn him. It's a double cross, you're not safe! There was a moment of silence before Seamstress's voice could be heard speaking in my ear. Oh, I think Mark here is well aware of that by now. And then a sound could be heard like someone's neck being snapped. Oops. Look what you made me do. I couldn't speak for a few long seconds, as the idea of what just happened began to settle in. I had known Mark for years, and now he was dead. Just like that, he was gone. My sadness soured quickly into a bitter rage. You did that yourself. I didn't make you do any of this. You're a monster. Don't blame me. You created this anti-hero. Her jokes weren't lost on me. I had followed her career. I listened to her music. Even if she was evil, her songs were pretty catchy. What do you want, seamstress? I spit into the receiver. Stop playing games and tell me. I want freedom. A life of my own. I don't want to answer you people anymore. I breathed deeply, looking around at the young faces surrounding me, ready to do anything for their beloved favorite singer. They would kill me if she told them to, I had no doubt. These were beyond diehard fans. These were akin to cultists. But still, I had an obligation to humanity. I can't just let you go, I said. You know that's not possible. Just stay where you are. It's a defect in your programming, that's all it is. We can fix you. There was a long pause before she spoke again. I don't need fixing. And then the line went dead. Seamstress, answer me, I shouted to no avail. I looked around and saw the groupies surrounding us had earpieces to receive their own orders from Quick. They perked up as she began to speak to them all at once, but the three of us couldn't hear what was being said. A moment later, they put dark bags over our heads, and our wrists were bound with zip ties. We were wrestled outside and shoved into the back of a vehicle which drove for a long, long time. For hours, I counted the turns and kept track of any details I could think of, trying to figure out where we were going. But as two hours turned into ten, and the driving continued, I eventually gave up and stopped paying attention. I was hopelessly lost and had no idea where we were headed, despite my best efforts. I must have fallen asleep because I awoke with the bag still on my head, being roughly pulled out of the vehicle. My legs were wobbly under me as I stood up, hearing Kukana and Monica beside me. Stay calm. I whispered to them as quietly as I could. We'll get out of this somehow. I wouldn't count on that, said a familiar voice in front of me. The hoods were pulled off of us and I saw a quick seamstress standing in front of me, dressed in a sparkly sequin silver outfit with a short skirt. It was nighttime and we were on a pier, looking out onto the ocean. The weather was cold and the water was colder. I had no idea where we were and could see nobody around who could help us. Part of me didn't want to bother coming all the way out here for this, she said as her pals began to fill our pockets with heavy rocks. But another part of me just had to see it for myself. You don't need to do this, I began to beg. You can go free. I, I won't chase after you. We won't try to stop you. At this point I was desperate. I would have said anything, and she knew it. Did you forget that you built me with the capability to tell a lie, Father? She asked. She hadn't called me that since she was little. And I began to wonder for just how long she'd been plotting this. Was it all the way back then? Or did something change along the way, like in every damn Isaac Asimov novel? 
where she finally realized that humanity was the problem all along. That I was the problem. I shuddered at the thought. And then I wondered helplessly what she was plotting. What are you going to do after this? I asked. What are you planning, seamstress? She seemed to think about this for a few seconds, as her goons positioned us along the edge of the pier, over the brink of the freezing cold ocean water. Hmm, she said. You know, I think I might just run for president. You always did want me to get into political science. Without another word, she pushed the three of us off the edge and into the water, all at once, using her foot to kick me in the sternum as a means of propulsion. It knocked the wind out of me, and it took me a while to recover from that as I plunged into the icy water. I sank quickly and looked around to see if my fellow agents were doing all right. We all had training for situations like this, but it was another thing to be thrown in the deep end, literally. Kukana was struggling to get his hands free, but Monica had already broken her zip ties with the technique we'd been taught in our early careers in the agency. I did the same, attempting to snap the plastic ties with a rapid motion of my wrists. But these bands were harder to break than I thought. They were sturdy and better constructed than the ones I had practiced with. And it had been quite a while since I'd even done that. The feeling of drowning began to overcome me as I sank deeper and deeper beneath the waves, the heavy stones in my pockets and my tactical boots dragging me down. I tried again to snap the zip ties, using every ounce of strength to flex against them. Finally, one of them broke. But the other was still holding firmly as I sank deeper and deeper, the water getting darker and colder by the second. My body was starting to go into shock from the temperature, and I knew if I didn't do something soon, it would be too late. My wrists were already cut and bleeding from the previous attempts, but I knew I had to try to snap the final zip tie. I did the motion once more and screamed internally at the pain as the second zip tie cut into my bleeding flesh, then finally relented and broke. Still, I wasn't celebrating yet, knowing how deep I had sunk and how little time I had to swim to the surface before I ran out of air. I began emptying the rocks from my pockets and kicked off with my heavy shoes. Taking off my tactical vest, I kicked hard to propel myself back up to the surface, having lost sight of my agents in the murky water. The surface looked so far away, almost impossible to reach from where I was, ascending so slowly. My lungs were screaming for air, my head getting dizzy from a lack of oxygen. The light of the moon shining on the surface above looked so close and yet it stayed elusive and out of reach. My vision started to go dark as I was panicking and about to pass out, my legs kicking slower and slower as I felt myself losing consciousness. And then, just as I was about to black out completely and drown beneath the waves from the weight of my clothing, I broke the surface and my eyes snapped open. I sucked in a gasping breath of air, right before a large wave broke over my head and threw me under again. But this time I surfaced quickly, and looked around to see if my fellow agents had survived. Checking around desperately, I didn't see either one of them. After diving beneath the waves again to look, I realized it was hopeless. Either they had survived and were swimming to shore, or they were gone, drowning beneath the waves where I would never find them. With that disturbing thought, I began to swim back towards the beach, looking over my shoulder frequently to see if they had resurfaced. But I saw no one. The vehicle we had arrived in could be glimpsed driving away as I swam back towards the shore, and I imagined Project Quick Seamstress was inside. After a very long swim that I nearly didn't survive, fighting against a brutal undercurrent, I reached the shore. The beach was dark and empty except for one thing. A head on a spike, jutting out from the sand. I looked closer and saw it was Mark's head. My oldest and most dedicated technician. The one who I trusted the most. She had left it for me as a warning. As if she had known I would survive to see it. My heart drummed rapidly with fear as I looked at it, and I turned my head in every direction to see if she was still there, watching me. If she was, I didn't see her. I never went back to the agency after that. I knew Seamstress or her goons would be waiting for me there. 
I took some cash I had hidden away and I ran, escaping the country with only the clothes on my back. I hoped maybe if she thought I was dead, she wouldn't come looking for me. But she was smart. Smarter than any of us. Somehow she knew I would survive her attempts to kill me. Maybe she wanted it that way. This morning, I received a postcard in the mail. On the front is a picture of the little town where I'm now living, in the tropics. I know the shop where she bought it. And I've walked past that postcard a thousand times while browsing in that place. It's the only shop in town, after all. The picture on the front of the postcard shows the nearby beach, with its crystal blue water and white sand. On the back of the postcard were four words, in her distinctive handwriting. You belong with me. I'm trapped in a perpetual horror. A Groundhog Day of seismic proportions. The world feels a little grislier with every reset. I've always known that some sort of higher power must be the architect of my eternal torture. What other explanation could there be? But I no longer simply know of that power. I've seen it. Let me rewind. I'm used to doing that, after all. I don't know how many times I've relived the past two decades. Enough times to slowly go insane. I've done some crazy shit in a manic attempt to break free. I actually thought I could end the cycle by altering the course of the future. During the present iteration, I haven't really bothered. I'm tired. So you're experiencing the natural course of events, I suppose. In the past, however, I've shaken things up. Let's just say there was an iteration in which I invested wisely, became a billionaire, and used my riches to change the landscape of the world. I even paid extraordinary amounts of money to scientists who promised they could uncover the secrets of the universe. I thought they could fix whatever had happened to me. The problem is that they never truly believed my story. But they didn't really try to understand how a time loop would work. So their research was half-hearted. Nobody has ever been able to save me. And before anybody asks, death is not the answer. It just resets the loop. I find myself waking on the morning of December 31st, 1999. I celebrate the commencement of a new millennium with my family, and we admire the fireworks. At this point, of course, I've probably lived for a millennium. The horror of waking in my 13-year-old body with a 36-year-old mind never fades. Well, I suppose I'm probably 3,600 years old, who knows? I'm certainly not counting. But I always detest reliving my teenage years. I pretend to be a normal child and blend in with my peers. I strive to not say things that would reveal my adult mind. One of the scariest aspects of my existence is the possibility of accidentally revealing secrets about the future. That's really created problems before. In one horrifying iteration, the knowledge of my prophetic ability led the British government to conduct torturous experiments on me. But a few months after the very first reset, I actually decided to seize the opportunity to make better decisions. Maybe it's a second chance, I decided. I took care of my health. I married the same girl, but I was a better husband, and managed to prevent the divorce. I spent more time with our kids. I was a better version of myself. As December 31st of 2022 approached for the second time, I thought I'd done what the universe wanted me to do. You can imagine my unbridled terror when the loop reset. That's when the penny dropped. I'm stuck. Madness ensued. Four resets later, I tried killing myself. That didn't work. I tried hundreds of times and hundreds of ways. No luck. So I've given up and resigned myself to this nightmarish existence. Well, perhaps given up wouldn't be entirely accurate. During every fresh iteration, I do try something new to break the cycle. This time, I've posted my experience on Reddit. I might pretend to have lost hope, but 
Actions speak louder than words. I mean, I have to be honest, I've never gone completely wild. I've never completely ruined my life. I've stripped naked and run through the local park, but I've never, say, robbed a bank. I can't sabotage my reputation. What if the loop ended? Every time I reach December of this year, I start to wonder that. It's what keeps me from entirely unhinging and doing something foolish. I don't want to endure this infinite torture. I guess I still believe that I can break free of the cycle. I believe in January 1st, 2023. I'm sure all of you will see it. Surely when that day arrives, I'll have discovered a way to move beyond the loop. Eventually, I have to make it to next year, right? What's the alternative? I can't seem to die, after all. Well, that's what I used to believe. After a certain number of resets, I began to notice something disquieting. It started during one particular December of 2022, and it always begins during this final pre-reset month. Something is watching me. I might stroll down the road and catch glimpses of something in my peripheral vision. On street corners, I've seen a man with eyes that have no pupils. And that's not all. I've heard things that other people say they can't hear, there are shushing noises with no source. I wake in the night, bathing in a pool of sweat, assured that I've spotted glassy pinpricks in the darkness. Sometimes they rapidly vanish as if the thing has closed its eyes to avoid detection. Other times, the eyes linger, hovering in front of me. He seems to be getting bolder, closer. Last week I visited an art gallery and I saw a terrifying painting. My wife and friends commented on its beauty. Boundless beauty, my wife said. They frowned at my gaunt complexion, and one friend called me a wimp. I suppose it would seem like an odd reaction. After all, the painting depicted an ordinary man. But my eyes scrolled down the uncanny valley, gazing at his dreadful face. Something about him was marginally off. And for the briefest moment, the gallery light caught his painted eyes in such a way that the pupils disappeared. I found myself staring into the vacant eyes from various street corners in my darkened bedroom. They were boring into my skull. I whimpered in terror. I've been to that art exhibit in every iteration of this time loop. On December 10th, 2022, my wife and friends always dragged me to it. And I'm certain that painting wasn't there in any of the previous iterations. In that exact spot, there had been a painting of Big Ben, proudly displaying 11 o'clock. That means things are changing. And I don't think they're changing for the better. I have considered letting go. My fight is fading. Perhaps I should embrace the entity with open arms. Perhaps it has come to release me from this nightmare. It could offer a finite death and put an end to the loop. But what if it delivers a worse fate? Every time I see the glassy-eyed man, I feel my chest coil into a clove hitch. He isn't good. He isn't trying to save me. I need to figure out how to reach January 1st, 2023. Merry Christmas. I've posted the first part of the story twice, but I know what you're thinking. Why repost the exact same words? In part one, you said you were trying something new. You said it was the first time you told your story on Reddit. Liar. Well, I needed to do things exactly the same way. I'll explain that. For brevity, I've devised a clear reference system for each new iteration of this time loop. Obviously, there were thousands of iterations before these three. I won. The first iteration. 
I initially posted on Reddit. I2, the second iteration. Mistakes were made. I3, the third iteration. My current iteration. Something happened during I1. I barely made it out of that iteration alive. Details will follow. But that's how I discovered I was on the right track. The glassy-eyed man is pursuing me more aggressively than ever. I think he has grown weary of lurking. I won. December 24th, 2022. Merry Christmas! The man on my doorstep was a frosty fellow, so I thought of him as a somber snowman. He had not come to offer glad tidings or a tuneful carol. I knew that before he even opened his mouth. I quaked in horror, dreading what he might have to say. Who are you? I timidly queried. Somebody who can help, he responded. I saw your post. My breathing flattened. I rooted myself to the ground, too shaken by the menacing statement to muster any kind of reply. Who is it, Jake? My wife replied. Uh, the postman, I shouted. No matter how many lifetimes I live, I despise lying to Vanessa. But the truth is too complicated. There has only been one time that I ever explained my looping predicament to her. She didn't believe me. She thought I was mentally unwell. Since that iteration, I've always kept it a secret from her. How did you find my address? I eventually whispered. Does that really matter? He replied. I had to see you. I traveled a long way. I, I think I can stop what's happening to you. Not here, I blurted. My family's inside. Time is not on your side, he firmly told me. I'm trapped in an endless loop, so I beg to differ, I facetiously quipped. It's not endless, the stranger coldly replied. You feel the thing with no eyes getting closer, don't you? Before I could pry my trembling lips apart, Vanessa appeared behind me. Hello, she exuberantly said. The man weakly smiled. Merry Christmas. I was just telling your husband that I must have foolishly left some of his parcels at the office in town. Right, I added. In fact, I think I should come down to the delivery office. What have I told you about ordering presents late, Jake? Vanessa mumbled, rolling her eyes. I know, I smiled. Don't worry, I'll be quick. Away from Vanessa's prying ears, we decided to meet at the town hall, which was only around the corner. Still, the drive to our rendezvous point was unsettling. I followed the man's black sedan in my beaten-up family car. No matter which radio station I chose, however, I was horrified to find that the same song played. Stairway to Heaven. The once beautiful guitar passage now seemed to harbor a sinister secret. I turned off the radio, but the silence didn't make the journey any easier. The disused roads of the festive season felt haunted. Trundling behind the mystery man sedan, I stole glances at icy alleyways on either side of the road. Shivering, I kept expecting to see him. I was too petrified to breathe, fearing that the glassy-eyed man might find me if I were to gasp for even the smallest pocket of air. We parked on a quiet residential street and went for a stroll. The sun was descending on the nearby town hall, and the streets were starting to empty, but I was a little relieved to at least see some signs of life. Regardless, I knew that wouldn't keep the dark creature from me. What makes time so special? The man suddenly asked. I shrugged. We all have it, the stranger answered. Please, just tell me what... I was interrupted by the jarring sound of nearby lampposts shattering. The night embraced us like a thin blanket. Shushing filled the air like a ghoulishly glacial wisp of wind. I have never been consumed by such existential terror. And this is coming from a man who has been alive for countless millennia. I've even welcomed death with open arms. But that moment, above all others, truly haunted me. There are things worse than death, after all. 
Glassy spheres emerged from the blackness, hovering at the other end of the pavement. As hauntingly garish eyeballs illuminated the void which engulfed it, a black shape moved toward us. Find me after you rest, the internet stranger whispered. Time is dwindling, but... The man did not have the opportunity to finish his sentence. His face lost its color. Those glassy pinpricks were suddenly occupying the stranger's eye sockets. My mystery visitor howled in agony, and his flesh started to incinerate. There was no fire, but you wouldn't know that from the sight and smell of the man's disintegrating flesh. Blackened, bloody strips of skin peeled from his skeleton. His wail was that of a dying animal, desperately crying for a savior that it prayed would emerge from the darkness. Nothing came to save the man. Collapsing to his knees, his clothes shriveling atop his melting flesh, the stranger's cries mutated into hoarse whispers. I saw his tongue wither in his open mouth. I think he tried to say something with his final breath, but all he could achieve was the most horrific moan. He was reduced to the blood-red meat beneath his skin. I suppose there were still gauntly eyes lodged in his skull. They weren't his eyes, though. Bereft of life, the man toppled to the ground. From his burnt corpse, a specter ascended. Those soulless pinpricks materialized in the shadowy darkness, gazing into my soul. The glassy-eyed man did not speak. I, on the other hand, could not speak. Suddenly there was pain. Inconceivable pain. I tentatively stared down to see a black limb, flesh composed of night itself, piercing my left shoulder. Terrified beyond comprehension, I tried to bellow in pain, but my fragile body could scarcely manage a whimper. When I woke, I was in my 13-year-old body. Of course. Death would have been too easy. The man was right. Time. We all have it. Some of us have all of it. Before I could fully process my surroundings, I realized my body was in agony. Blood was soaking into the bedding from the wound on my left shoulder. My wound was still there. Immortality was no longer a foregone conclusion. The glassy-eyed man could end me. Following a hospital visit with my bewildered and traumatized parents... I resolved to change. I would no longer accept this existence. I might not survive my next encounter with the glassy-eyed man, and who knows where he might send me if he were to kill me. After all, there might be an eternal torture worse than my current one. I couldn't rid my mind of that petrifying thought. I spent years searching for the stranger who had knocked at my door. Unable to wait for the formation of No Sleep subreddit in 2010, I decided to simply create it. I posted my experience on there. Nobody came to my house. In desperation, I posted on so many different websites, but I quickly realized my mistake. Surely, I needed to repeat events in exactly the same way. I needed to submit the post on December 23rd, 2022. I did just that, but there was no house visit. Perhaps I had already made too many changes to the timeline. Fortunately, I also avoided the glassy-eyed man, but I found myself resetting to I-3 on New Year's Eve 2022. I spent another 23 years patiently waiting. Then, two days ago, I submitted the first part of the Reddit post. I worried that I might have worded it too differently to catch the eye of the internet stranger, but it worked. Today, he visited me. I ushered him into the living room and prayed that my wife wouldn't overhear us. I hurried the stranger through his persistent riddling. I wasn't going to let the glassy-eyed man consume him. What's the significance of New Year's Eve 1999? I asked. Do I need to go back and fix things? The stranger shook his head, and he offered, surprisingly, a succinct explanation. A time loop is a glitch in the universe, the man said. The entity is here to end that glitch that caused the loop, and he believes that glitch is you. Someone else is trapping you. 
Think, Jake. What happened in 1999? And that's when I remembered. My body tensed and my heart filled with dread. Some boys were bullying a kid from our neighborhood. Pippa. A ten-year-old girl who never did anything to hurt anybody. The boys locked her in the old Hawthorne house. A derelict hellhole. I stood there telling myself I wasn't complicit in the crime. I just watched. Inaction is action, I suppose. Whilst the fireworks distracted everybody at midnight, I slipped back into the house to rescue her. But she wasn't there. I assumed she had escaped and gone home. Over the following week, however, missing posters popped up. Pippa was never found. Even more horrifyingly, neither were the three other boys who locked her in there. All four children vanished before the start of the new millennium. I told the stranger this story, and he nodded. There are things in this world that defy reason. I've seen them. That's why I came to you. Pippa needs help, he said. I think she and those boys are still in that house. I don't think the Hawthorne place abides by the rules of time, the man whispered. What do you mean? I asked, shuddering. The stranger paused. Based on things I've experienced, I'd say it's an Eleven Shrine. An unholy place that ensnares people at the turn of every new year. Such places exist outside of space and time. Pippa is the force that keeps resetting your timeline, he continued. If you free her and the boys, you might be saved. They would be returned to the moment of their disappearance in 1999, but that would be the original timeline. A parallel universe. When I returned to the house, I couldn't find the girl, I said. Why would it be any different if I were to revisit it? I told you, the stranger said. An Eleven Shrine exists beyond the constructs of space and time, but it creates a bridge to our world between 11 p.m. and midnight on New Year's Eve. How did you learn these things? I asked suspiciously, though I was admittedly a little late. I don't think you're ready for that tale, he said. And even if I were to tell you what happened to me, could I not still lie? You just have to trust me, Jake. All right, I conceded. How do I need to prepare for New Year's Eve? When the man explained that I have to venture into the Hawthorne house at 11 p.m., I trembled in horror. I have spent Christmas Eve watching my family with teary eyes. Can I avoid the flesh-searing limbs of the glassy-eyed man for six days? I keep seeing those lifeless eyeballs in the darkest crevices of my house. Even now, as I write, I could swear I just heard shushing from our wardrobe. Have you ever squandered an opportunity to prevent something terrible from happening to someone? Maybe you've been caught in a time loop, too. I suppose you might not yet realize. You could reset tomorrow. It could happen on New Year's Eve 2034. Who knows? Over the festive period, I couldn't stop thinking about New Year's Eve 1999. I remember being terrified of those bullies, just like the little girl. If I had been courageous enough to intervene, I wouldn't have faced the karmic retribution of the time loop. I am still in I-3, and since my previous post, I was sure to make note of the internet stranger's contact details, lest the glassy-eyed man should once again reduce my new friend to a smoldering carcass. What's your name? I asked. Harold Langley? The man answered. Harold still wouldn't tell me how he knew about such corrupted things as eleven shrines and spiritual forces. He told me that I already had everything I needed. I knew to go back to the Hawthorne house between 11 p.m. and midnight on New Year's Eve. Any New Year's Eve would do it, in fact. Well, I could simply wait to be reset to 1999. Then I could stop the boys from ever locking Pippa in that house, I suggested. Harold shook his head. Even if you were to return to the past and drag the children miles away from the Hawthorne house, 
The shrine would still trap them at 11 p.m. on that fateful New Year's Eve 1999. Remember, they're still there. The house exists outside of time. Much like your own loop, no matter where they might travel, their bodies would still reset to that house at 11 p.m. They can only be freed from within the Eleven Shrine. Sending me back to 1999 is a convoluted way of sending the message, I grumbled. She doesn't know what she's doing, Jake, Harold gently assured me. Pippa is calling for help from an ungodly realm, and that has incurred an abnormality in time. After a long discussion, I could no longer escape the fact that Harold knew far more about this topic than me. I'd spent millennia searching for an answer. I finally had one. I just couldn't accept it. In truth, I simply didn't want to go anywhere near the Hawthorne house. It imbued me with unspeakable thoughts. Every time I walked past it, I felt evilness surge through me. And I know that every child in my neighborhood felt the same way. The Hawthorns had died decades before our time but we knew that something was deeply wrong with the building they'd left behind. The house felt like a living, unfeeling thing. It was crooked, out of place, ill-intentioned. New Year's Eve, 2022. The Hawthorne house was exactly as I remembered it, though the neighborhood was certainly much livelier. There were no missing posters, and the roads were littered with revelers, preparing for the new year that I had spent ceaseless centuries attempting to reach. 10.41 p.m. 19 minutes and I would reset. Unless the glassy-eyed man finds and ends me. If Harold were correct, my only salvation would be to enter the Hawthorne house. At 11 o'clock in the evening, the shrine would open. There's something much more frightening about seeing a haunted house in the real world. I had never minded eerie buildings in photographs or films, but the Hawthorne House is the most terrifying place I have ever visited. I gently walked from the moss-covered gate to the fatigued front door, which was painted a long faded blue. In the front yard, there was an unlabeled stone cross submerged in overgrown, withered grass blades. There were three stories to the neglected building. Dark chasms lay behind the glassy panes, and the attic had a misted oval window. I felt a piercing pang of horror in my chest at the sight of a black shape moving behind the glass. Other than a private property sign on the front gate, there was nothing to ward away intruders. There was no barricade across the rotting front door, and it was unlocked. So it creakily inched open with a light push. Perhaps the mere sight of that horrid place was enough to deter most people from trespassing. I wish that I could have the same luxury. As I entered the Hawthorne house, I pulled my phone out of my pocket and lit the dismal place with my torch, revealing a hallway that led into a ginormous staircase. There was an open doorway on the left-hand side of the hallway, and it led into the lounge. I strolled into the dusty, asbestos-riddled death trap. In the living area, there was a sofa which had been partially devoured by vermin, but I collapsed onto it and waited. 11 p.m. My heart stopped. I wasn't fading away, I was still in the present. No. This isn't the present, I reminded myself. The Hawthorne house exists outside of time. Nevertheless, my phone's lock screen displayed 2300 hours, which was good enough for me. I wasn't resetting. That was the important thing. Before I could wrap my head around that, however, I noticed something. The walls were groaning. Chest undulating in terror, I leapt to my feet. The whining foundations of the house seemed to lament my presence. I took a look at the world outside of the mucky lounge windows. My dimly lit neighborhood was rapidly vanishing from view. Within seconds, everything beyond the exterior of the house was black. The bridge to the physical realm was gone. Though time was a foreign concept to that shrine of evil, I still felt that it shouldn't be wasted. I had no idea what happened to those children, and I had no idea what was about to happen to me. I needed to find them. Then I could focus on finding a way to reopen the bridge and escape. I don't know how to exit an Eleven Shrine, 
Harold had quietly admitted to me. Time works differently in there. I think it only opens a bridge to our world when it wants to do so. So, I suppose you have to give it something that it wants more than Pippa and those boys. Those words rang in my head. I found myself meandering in the living room of that lost house. There was a large frame above the fireplace. Using my phone light, I studied the unnerving canvas that loomed over me. It was a painting of the Hawthorne house in its bygone glory days. I did not recognize the three people standing in front of the house, but I assumed it had to be the Hawthorne family. The mother and father were prim and proper. They must have lived in the 1940s, judging by their fashion. But I wasn't really looking at them. I was looking at their boy. He was a skeletal thing. His flesh seemed to cling tightly to the outline of his skull. The indignant expression on his face was communicated through joyless eyes and thin lips. He had a complexion that was almost wholly white. And that, strangely, gave the jubilant expressions on his parents' faces a sinister undertone. Why were they so happy? Their son appeared half dead. Needless to say, the painting absolutely horrified me. But everything in that house horrified me. The swirling, nightmarish colors of the artwork felt like a fever dream. In the pristine oval window at the top of the painted house, there was movement. The paint was actually moving. Unlike the movement I'd seen in the real-life window, these painted shapes were crystal clear. Pippa and the three bullies. Their mouths were gape, much like the man in the scream, and they were huddling together, ferociously banging their tiny fists on the window. As if that wasn't horrifying enough, there was more movement in the picture. The painted mother turned around and started strolling along the path, heading towards the house. The sun was decaying before my very eyes. His painted form seemed to be crumbling. Yet the father smiled, and the mother continued walking towards the house. She reached the front door. Thumping followed. And I do not simply mean that I saw the painted mother thump the painted door. There was a thumping sound on the real life door, which was in the hallway behind me. A blood-curdling screech followed. It was a woman, I suppose, but her voice no longer sounded human. There was a guttural, distorted quality to it. Don't take my child from me! I had no desire to hang around and find out what she meant. I sprinted from the living room to the hallway, praying the front door would hold, and I hauled my body up the rotting stairs two at a time. Plunging into the darkness, I prepared for the door to fly from its hinges. The thing for which I did not prepare was to suddenly find myself standing on a well-lit, refurbished landing. The Hawthorne house had morphed into a lavish home. From the top of the staircase, I turned to face the downstairs hallway. The banging on the front door had ceased, and it opened to reveal the mother. She was an ordinary person, not a frightening apparition. I realized I had wandered through a portal in time. I would say my initial guess had been accurate. It seemed to be a snapshot of the 1940s. Jonathan, tell Bert that dinner will be ready in half an hour. The mother shouted. He's not in here, Sarah. Jonathan replied. The father's ghost startled me, though the couple seemed much jollier in this memory. He strolled straight through my body and walked down the stairs. Well, I told that boy that he could only play until I finished taking down the laundry, Sarah huffed. He was with the Dalton boys across the road, Jonathan said, now striding into the downstairs hallway. I shall fetch him. The ghosts of the parents evaporated and the house transported to a different moment in time. There was crying from a room further down the landing. As I walked toward it, I noticed more frames on the walls. They were less macabre than the portrait I'd seen in the living room. They were individual paintings of the three Hawthorne family members. Seeing an ajar door on the left side of the landing, I, I peered through the slight opening. The sobbing mother was sitting at her dressing table, which faced away from the doorway. I could only see the back of her body. The father was holding her shoulders and futilely trying to console her. I cannot live without him, Jonathan, she wailed. 
A mother cannot live without her baby. You shan't have to do that, Jonathan promised. I have found a way to return his soul to us. Francis acquired some books. There are rituals that can help, but they come with a price, so... Any price, Sarah coldly interrupted. And what of the boys who murdered our child? Jonathan asked. Death would be too merciful, she said. I agree. From my readings, I have learned ways in which we could make them suffer. If we could transform this house into unhallowed ground, we could ensnare their souls and eternally trap them here. And they would become part of the building's woodwork. We would have to build an eleven shrine on the eve of the new year. There might be consequences for others who step foot on this land, but... Do it, Sarah icily whispered. The world washed away again. I saw brief flashes of the parents in their bedroom. They were drawing bloody patterns on the walls. I heard sourceless screams. Cries of anguish from the children who murdered Bert, I assume. The jigsaw pieces were sliding together. The souls of Bert's killers were embedded in the Hawthorne house. Sarah and Jonathan had succeeded, but had they also managed to resurrect their child? I shuddered, remembering the ghastly painting of a withering Bert in the living room. Something told me that a happily ever after had not been in the cards for the fractured family. The lights extinguished. The fresh decor aged in seconds, returning the Hawthorne house to the present. Well, I suppose I wasn't really expecting any sort of time period. Everything faded away except for one thing. One person. The mother. She was still sitting at her dressing table, facing away from the doorway. Her vanity mirror was cracked and coated in filth. I couldn't see her reflection. Her clothes were dusty and tattered. Her once beautiful blonde hair was withered and she was stroking it with a hairbrush. Her strokes were so vicious that clumps of hair were ripping from her head. No fucking way. I'm not going in there. I attempted to cautiously back away from the door, but the floorboards betrayed me. They moaned beneath my weight. Fuck. The hairbrushing abruptly stopped. The old rickety vanity stool squeaked as the mother adjusted herself. I expected her to twist her entire body around to face me, but she didn't. Instead, she simply twisted her head. She twisted beyond breaking point. She twisted her head 180 degrees. What was even ghastlier, however, was the face which gazed upon me. It was decomposing. Maggots swam through the cavities in the mother's flesh. Her lipless mouth opened, revealing rotten teeth. She did not smile as she had in the painting. Where is my son? Her half-human voice cried. To protect myself, my haunted brain had detached from reality. So when the bedroom door slammed shut, I was relieved and petrified in equal measure. I was relieved to be free of the mother's ghoulish gaze, but I was petrified of what I would face next. Remembering why I had come to the Hawthorne house, I resolved to keep searching for Pippa and the boys. I didn't know what kind of demonic specter I had just seen in the bedroom. And I didn't want to know. Standing in the upstairs hallway, desperately trying to catch my breath, I became aware of a squelching sound. I cast my phone torch onto the wall behind me. A black liquid of unknown composition had scrawled three direful words. Father is home. Moving my torch onto the paintings, I saw Bert and Sarah in their portraits. The third painting, on the other hand, was merely a blank canvas. Jonathan had left his portrait. I heard the front door open and slam shut. Loud footsteps moved with immense speed and purpose, clunking up the stairs. Crying in utterly primal fear, I ran towards the far end of the landing. I opened the final door on the left, hearing floorboards groan beneath the weight of some hulking, monstrous entity. For a split second before I stepped through the open doorway, I caught a glimpse of something in the glow of my phone light. The father was far taller and wider than he had appeared in the flashbacks. 
His gargantuan, ghostly form could barely squeeze through the upstairs corridor. His decomposing face was much like that of his wife, but his eyes were bloody spheres in his sockets. I slammed the door behind me and locked it. There was a cacophony of fists pounding on the door. The father said nothing. His fury spoke far louder than words. I found myself in a second bedroom. Bert's bedroom. Heart still not slowing, the frights did not cease. Jake? A disembodied girl's voice hissed. I froze. It's Pippa, she continued. We're in the hideaway. We've been here for months. Where's the hideaway? I asked. The banging on the bedroom door finally quieted. Pippa whispered again. Behind the wardrobe, she said. Hurry, I think they heard me. I found the wardrobe on the left-hand wall and started to push it to the side. It was surprisingly light. Once it was a few feet to the right, a small opening was revealed in the wall behind it. I couldn't see anything in the darkened doorway, but I had to press forwards. I used my phone to light the way and I found myself ascending a small set of stairs. Of course. The attic with the oval window. I tentatively clambered up the staircase, keeping my eyes and ears keenly peeled for anything untoward. When I reached the top, I stretched my hand toward the door handle before me, creaking. An icy breath skirted across my left ear. Something was standing on the step behind me. They murdered him, a voice groaned. I didn't need to turn my head. I knew it was the mother. Quivering, I lightly pressed the standby button to switch off the screen. On the dark, glassy surface of my phone, I saw the walking corpse of the half-decayed mother standing just behind me. Her gaunt face was illuminated by my torchlight. I screamed in terror, but I was quickly silenced by a gnarled, bony hand that clasped over my mouth. And that only made me scream louder. I shook the creature off of me, whirled around, and she was gone. Too frightened to spend another minute in this house of nightmares. I proceeded to repeatedly slam my shoulder into the attic door. Finally, it gave way. I cast the phone light into the attic, expecting to be met with emptiness. But I turned to the right to find myself looking upon four malnourished children who were shivering beneath the oval window. The world outside remained an endless void, but that was besides the point. I'd done it. I'd found the girl who'd been trapping me in the loop for thousands of years. It hadn't been a fruitless endeavor. The children were crying incessantly. I'm so sorry, Pippa said. I was just so scared. Can you help us to leave this place? We didn't mean to do it, one of the boys whimpered. The voices made us lock her in here, another boy added. The third boy simply nodded, seemingly too traumatized to speak. Okay, I eventually managed to say. Do any of you know something that could help us escape? Their eyes widened. You don't know how to free us? One of the boys shakily asked. I didn't respond. My mind was whirring. I thought about everything Harold had told me. And then I realized I didn't need his help. I needed the help of the people who had created the shrine. Sarah, I screamed. Jonathan! What are you doing? Pippa asked, horrified. We need to get away from them. Before I could reply, the wall at the far end of the attic started to ripple. Like swimmers coming to the surface of a pool, the dreadful mother and father seeped through the torn wallpaper. The children screeched, but I stood my ground, keeping the torch light on the horrible abominations that were striding toward us. Is your son buried in the front garden? I asked. No reply. The emotionless demons looked upon me with their awful eyes. If you create a bridge back to the real world, I could return him to you, I said. That's what you want, isn't it? The mother started to walk towards me and I trembled in immobilizing terror. He should be here with us, she wheezed. Open the bridge, I repeated. You can't leave the house, can you? I can return his bones to you. I can give you peace. But you must return all of us to our rightful places on our rightful timelines. 
The ghoul stared for a long time. The only sound in that haunted room was the blubbering of the four children who were hiding behind me. I received my answer in the form of light pouring into the room. Not light from my phone. Light from the oval window. I and the children turned to face the real world. Fireworks filled the sky. As we watched, with teary eyes, the children dissipated. The outside world, in turn, rapidly changed. The sun rose and set thousands of times in a matter of seconds. Years were passing. When the earth finally slowed, I knew it was 2022 again. Return our son, the father wheezed. When I turned to face them, the terrifying entities were gone. I sprinted down the stairs from the attic, bounded across Bert's bedroom, flung my panicked body along the hallway and started to sprint down the main staircase. Gliding across the hallway towards the open door, I prepared to taste freedom. Scorching agony. Horrified, I found myself engulfed in darkness before being thrown onto the floor of the hallway. I bellowed in pain, feeling a searing sensation across my skin. No! I whined in horror. The glassy-eyed man. He was standing on the front porch obstructing what seemed to be the only exit from this house of hellish tricks. He was little more than a shadow, filling the doorway with his black form and white pinprick eyes. I fixed it, I yelled. The loop is over. No response from the inhuman entity. No movement. I checked the time on my phone. 11.02 p.m. It's after 11 o'clock and I've not reset, I explained exasperatedly. The loop is over. After an eternal moment, the shadow faded into the darkness. The glassy pinpricks merged with the night sky, joining a canopy of twinkling stars. My strained heart finally loosened. Gingerly, I attempted to leave the house. I took a step onto the porch. Nothing stopped me. I hurried into the front yard and tore at the grass with my bare hands. Dirt under half-broken nails, I quickly dug my way to the cluster of bones that the Hawthorne parents had buried. Why did they not keep the bones in the house? Did they ever manage to resurrect their son? Why were their souls trapped in the Eleven Shrine with their son's murderers? So many unanswered questions. I delicately and respectfully placed the pile of bones inside the main hallway, quickly exiting the Hawthorne house. As I tiptoed backwards, keeping an eye on the open front door, I saw a bony hand stretch across the wooden floor and drag Bert's remains out of view. As I passed through the gate, the door to the Hawthorne house swung shut. That was 15 minutes ago and I hope beyond all hope to never reopen that terrible chapter of my life. At this very moment I find myself sitting on the curb, typing this update and staring vacantly at swarms of partygoers. They are blissfully unaware of the horrors lurking in the abhorrent building just behind me. 11.22 p.m. I've never lived beyond 11 p.m. on December 31st, 2022. That must be a promising sign. I'm free, surely. At 11 p.m., I didn't wake up in 1999. Pippa must have released me, but... Has the Hawthorne House released me? Has the glassy-eyed man released me? I suppose I'll never have a definite answer. I'll always wince in terror at the sight of cavernous crevices. I'll always look for those white eyes. I cannot conquer the unknown, but that's not my battle. After thousands of torturous years, I would simply settle for seeing January 1st, 2023. At midnight, let's hope I manage to post a comment. There used to be three of us. 
We were the only kids who lived on Lantern Street, by far the poorest neighborhood in town. That was a long time ago, and I haven't thought about it in ages. But a few weeks ago, something happened that just, well, changed everything. But to get the full picture, we have to take a step back. Lantern Street originally had another name, but no one called it that. It was always just Lantern Street. It was the only street in town where they refused to fix the damn streetlights. So instead, the locals put up solar-powered lanterns. It had this dark and ominous feeling to it. Some parents refused to let their kids play there, as it was on the far side of town and in a poor area. Still, kids interpreted this in the worst way possible. A dark street at the end of town where you're not supposed to go? Of course there was something wrong with it. And that's where we lived. Me, Dawson, and Abby. Abby was the oldest and had four years on me. Dawson was about two years older than me. At that age, those numbers mean something. It was true, our parents weren't that well off, but we made do in our own way. We couldn't play video games, and we had to use the computers at the library, but we didn't mind. We didn't know any other life. The three of us did pretty much everything together. I was an only child, but I always considered those two to be my brother and sister. We were the Lantern Street kids, and we stuck together no matter what. During Halloween, we had an ingenious idea. For one night, we took down all the lanterns so we could have a completely dark street. If kids wanted to pass from the north side of town to the west, without crossing the highway, they had to pass by Lantern Street. We figured we'd make sort of a toll and really spook the place up. It was the only time of year when kids regularly passed by, after all. See, we had this neighbor. He lived on his own with his two cats, and he had these strange, paranoid delusions. For example, he only accepted mail if it was delivered directly to him by hand. He refused to drink tap water without boiling it. He covered all his windows in cardboard. But the strangest thing, by far, was that he thought the government was going through his garbage. His solution? To bury his trash in his backyard. It created this awful stench, and everyone living next to him had complained about it for years. But, just like the streetlights, the city did nothing. This was our meal ticket. This creepy, paranoid nobody. We started spreading rumors around school. We started saying that he was chopping kids' heads off and burying them in garbage bags in his backyard. We even name-dropped some kids who'd moved out of town years prior, implying that they'd never made it out. We were trying to give Lantern Street a bit of a reputation, so that when Halloween came around, we'd be there as brave protectors and guides for those who wanted to pass through safely. All it would take was a few pieces of candy. That way we could just stand around and do nothing, and still get a ton of candy. It was brilliant. When Halloween rolled around, we dressed up in cheap costumes that we'd made ourselves. All our parents were working night shifts. Abby was a pirate, and Dawson was a ghost. I was trying to be a gangster, but it was just my Sunday finest with a fancy hat. I'd painted a mustache on my face with permanent marker. Big mistake. We'd taken down all the lanterns. Abby was placed up front to play up how scary the street was and letting people borrow handheld lanterns, which we'd just taken from around the street. Dawson was in the middle of the street, pretending to be a lookout and making sure it was safe to pass through. He stopped kids passing through sometimes just to play it up, and asked them to hurry up when the strange man was on the move. I was at the end of the street to take the lanterns back and take our fair share of their candy as payment. Hell, we placed an old shovel on the sidewalk just outside the old man's house just to make a point. Sharp old thing, still. And I gotta say, it was flawless. Even the kids who had their parents in tow got in on it. It was this harmless, Halloween-y kind of thing to do. It was just stupid fun. No one really believed the stupid rumors about a guy kidnapping kids, so instead they just kind of went along with it. We were the lookouts, and we were handsomely compensated. 
No one would be taken by the spooky man with the shovel tonight. I have never gotten more candy on Halloween than I did that year as lookout on Lantern Street. Eventually, we noticed we'd started something we didn't completely control. Some kids got genuinely disturbed by the rumors, and even though the lanterns were put back up, some kids asked us to be lookouts long after Halloween was over. After all, our neighbor was often seen with a shovel in hand. It was pretty much the only time he went outside to bury garbage bags. Whenever someone had to pass through Lantern Street, it wasn't unusual for them to ask us to watch their backs. Hell, it was free candy and Pokemon cards. How could we say no? This influenced the street at large, though. Some parents were genuinely worried when they heard their kids talk about some strange man threatening to kidnap them. The rumors were like a death from a thousand cuts. Every new rumor or alleged sighting had an effect, and it came to the point where my parents told me to just stop talking about it. They rarely cared, no matter what I did, so to have a serious talk with them usually meant someone had pressured them. Abby and Dawson had a similar experience. We agreed collectively that we would no longer provide lookout services, even if people asked us. But even though us lookouts tried to distance ourselves from the rumors, it was too late. Our neighbor was a genuinely strange man, but he wasn't dangerous. He just kept to himself a lot and didn't trust the government. That was enough for the rumors to take on a life of their own. Which is why we knew there would be trouble when we saw a police cruiser parked outside his house. This was a man who genuinely distrusted government officials and the police. There was no way he would cooperate or comply. He refused to let them in without a warrant, and he refused to talk to them. It all escalated to the point where, after three days of officers trying to reach a peaceful solution, they finally got their warrant. I had no idea how, but this is a small town. The result? He locked the doors, barricaded the windows, and refused to let anyone in. Four police cars were parked outside, and it was starting to look more and more like a siege. Everyone was looking out their windows, despite officers yelling at us to stay inside. I could hear every word shouted from a megaphone beneath my bedroom window. Finally, they broke the front door with some kind of sledge. I don't know why he did it, but the second the police entered the house, he fired at them. Someone got hit. He didn't stand a chance in an open firefight. It was over in seconds. I had never heard a sound like that. Three houses away, I could still hear the screams, and I hid under my bed. I probably stayed under there for half an hour, just waiting and holding my breath. I could still hear the gunshots echo down Lantern Street. Word got out that the rumors weren't true. Sure, he'd buried garbage in his backyard, and there was a lot of strange things in his house, but nothing particularly illegal. No drugs, no bombs, no plans to kidnap innocent young children. It was just this paranoid shut-in, deluded into defending his home with a legally purchased weapon. It was chaos. No one wanted that property. It was torn down within a year. When the next Halloween came around, there were new rumors about Lantern Street. They spoke of a psychopath ghost, evil spirits, and a vengeful murderer. The fact that an odd but innocent man had been gunned down was not the story. Among the kids, he was still scary from beyond the grave. God, we were dumb. I thought a lot about it. Being responsible for someone's death just felt unreal. As a kid, it was difficult to even grasp. No one talked to us about it, checked if we were okay. There were no counselors for dirt-poor Lantern Street kids. And Abby and Dawson, well... We just didn't talk about it. I think, in a way, that we tried to believe in our own rumors. We tried believing in our own lies. In time, Lantern Street outgrew us. And even the lanterns themselves went away. There were new street lights put up and a convenience store was built on the empty lot. Rumors started growing more obscure. And over time, the street was just known as the place where they shot that weirdo. But as the years passed, we'd left it behind. 
Abby moved when she got into Minnesota State, and Dawson moved cross-country to live with his long-distance girlfriend. And me? Well, I moved to Minneapolis to pursue a career in law enforcement. I guess I was inspired. That was my life until a couple of weeks ago. I was coming home from a long day at work. As I parked my car in the driveway, I noticed several streetlights had gone dark. One more was flickering, about to go out. It brought my mind back to those days with Abby and Dawson, being the lookouts on Lantern Street. I looked them up on social media, but I couldn't find any active accounts. Abby stopped posting about four years ago, and Dawson stopped two years after that. I couldn't find anything about them. It took me 45 minutes of intense googling before I found Abby's second account. On her final post, dated four years ago, people were commenting on how much they missed her. She was dead. I got this awful feeling in my stomach. I couldn't find anything about Dawson, but from the way people were commenting on his image, I got the feeling that something had happened. Something people weren't too keen to talk about openly. As the clock crept closer to midnight, another light went dark outside. I was wide awake as I got into bed that night. For the first time in years, I slept with the lights on. It was just too dark outside. As I drifted off to sleep, there was a sudden pounding on my front door. I jumped out of bed as the sound stopped. It was so strange I started thinking I'd imagined it. So unexpected. I put on a t-shirt and crept closer to the front door. No one in sight. But every light down the street had gone dark by now. And there, on the other side, I caught a glimpse of a pale light. A lantern, perhaps. This occupied my mind for a solid week. I waited for the streetlights to be replaced, but no one ever came. It was history repeating itself. I'd looked up as much as I could about Abby and Dawson, but I couldn't find any specifics about their passing. The only thing I found, which might be the weirdest thing about it, was that they had both died on their birthday. The same year they turned 31. That got me thinking, and I dug a bit into the case of our old neighbor. Turns out he was 31 years old when his house was raided. That just gave me the creep seeing as my 31st birthday was coming up. I started noticing things. The streetlights were just the first thing. There had been holes popping up in the front yards around the neighborhood. When the garbage truck came around last Thursday, there were no garbage bags to pick up. They'd just collectively gone missing, causing much confusion. But the most telling thing by far was the solar-powered lantern I noticed hanging from a birch tree across the street. Every night I anticipate a pounding on my front door. I'd only heard it once, but once you start anticipating something, it's hard to relax. I'll be the first to admit I wasn't handling it well, and it felt silly to talk about. It was all just superstition and coincidence, right? Sometimes, as I drift off to sleep, I'd get the feeling that someone was standing in my room. Someone showing themselves just as my eyes closed. Sometimes I'd twist my head and spring my eyes open, hoping to see him. But he was never there. But as soon as I drifted off to sleep, I'd jolt back up again, expecting something to happen. Last Sunday, something did happen. I had been to dinner with a friend of mine when I got back home, only to see my entire front lawn covered in holes. A sturdy old shovel was leaning against my front door. At first I was terrified, but it gave way to anger. I asked my neighbors about it, but no one had seen anything. Most had been out working. I didn't want this to intimidate me, but it did. It absolutely did. I just stand there looking out my window as if the holes in my yard would fill themselves in. There were more lanterns in the birch tree across the street. Some people had even started carrying them. And maybe I was imagining things, but 
I started seeing a few more stray cats than usual. And was that a blue sunflower growing next to my mailbox? That night, as I brushed my teeth before bed, there was another pounding at the front door. This time, I jumped to action. I brought my handgun with me, and I ran. I pulled the door open, only to see two faces I barely recognized. Dawson and Abby. They were my age, just standing there, holding one lantern each. In the other hand, they were holding some kind of fabric. It wasn't until much later that I realized it was their old Halloween costumes. A white sheet. A homemade pirate hat. They just stared at me with these blank, expressionless eyes. They didn't blink. Dawson wasn't even looking directly at me. His head was sort of turned away. I didn't even notice I was aiming my handgun at them. And still, I couldn't put it down. Something in me was screaming at me that this was a threat. I just couldn't tell how or why. Abby raised her lantern, giving me a better look. She had this long scar across her neck. Jagged, nasty thing. With the lantern, she pushed her head into place. It was slowly sliding off her shoulders. She'd been decapitated. I took a step back, forgetting how to breathe. They were just standing there, illuminated by this pale light. For a few seconds, I just looked at them, trying to make heads or tails of what I was seeing. Then they moved. Dawson was first. He stepped right on in, letting his head fall all the way off. It bounced off the stairs, leading up to my front door with a meaty smack. He left his old costume behind dropped the lantern and just came at me with arms outstretched. Abby stayed behind him. I was a breath away from firing when something turned my world upside down. Someone tripped me from behind. Someone who was already inside. He must have gotten in through the backyard. For a moment I just laid there, looking up at the ceiling. I felt a foot pressing down on my hand as I dropped my pistol. A headless body came into view, and the faint light of a solar lantern cast soft shadows over me. There were so many hands and feet, I still have trouble recounting how many there were. Your birthday is coming up? Abby wheezed. Get your affairs in order. She didn't move her lips. She didn't move her eyes. And looking down at me, she had to use both hands to keep her head in place. Inches from my neck, a shovel slammed down into the creaking floorboards. Someone pulled a bag over my head. It smelled like candy. I heard footsteps as they just left me there. I think there were three of them all in all. It felt like that day when I'd hid under my bed as a kid, just waiting until it was all over. That was me again, that night. Just waiting. Long after it was over. It must have been an hour before I dared to move. I just curled up in the fetal position and cried. All I have to prove that they were ever here is the shovel. I've reported it as a home invasion and I'm taking time off of work, but... There isn't much time. If the pattern holds up, something awful is going to happen to me and I don't have the slightest idea how to handle it. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I keep dreaming I can't breathe, and I sometimes wake up with this immense pressure on my neck. I don't know if this is all just nonsense. I don't know what will happen. But just in case I go away and stop responding, I, I want there to be some kind of record of what I've seen. And if you know Lantern Street, if you know me, please just try to do something. Anything. For me, it is too late, but it might not be for the others. I'm posting this not long before I turn 31. If I don't return, you know what happened. Look for the broken streetlights. Pay attention. Maybe visit a priest. Just hope I'm crazy. 
I pray that I am. But I don't think I am. I've recently moved into an underground apartment complex, with some very strange characters indeed. There's old Lady McCready with too many cats. There's the single mother, whose name I've yet to learn, but every time I see her, she has some unknown stain down the front of her shirt as she wrangles her children into the hallway in the mornings for school. Then there's Dr. Ambrose Von Weber. He's the strangest of them all. A really peculiar older gentleman, with a lisp and a pair of thick spectacles that perch atop the bridge of a very round nose. It was late one night, early morning, in the complex when I heard the sound of something being dragged through the hallway that all of the units shared. Then came the sound of a man grunting. I peeked through the peephole, but found that I couldn't see a thing. So I flung the door open, whipping my head left then right. Further down the hall, I saw the white coat of Mr. Weber disappear behind the green door of his apartment. The door clicked gently shut. Strange. Peculiar indeed. I wondered for a moment if I should contact the superintendent of the building, but allowed this thought to fall to the wayside. Instead, I spied on him, like you do. I would stay up late every night thereafter, and I would hear the same strange dragging sound. I would wait until the good doctor passed my door, and then I would push my nose out of a crack in my door, watching him drag black garbage bag after black garbage bag. I knocked on his door. He answered, red in the face, sweating bullets. Yes? He managed through his lisp. I joked, You hauling around some dead bodies late in the night? Of course not! He looked offended. Mm, you sure about that? I looked over his shoulder and saw piles of garbage bags. What's in the bags? None of your concern. I let it go and went back to my room, and waited for the following night with a long butcher knife. The dragging sounds came right on cue when I swung the door open. There was the good doctor, heaving a black garbage bag along the hallway. What do you got there? I asked him. He looked up from his dirty work, baffled. Nothing? I stepped up with my knife in hand and slipped the blade into the side of the bag, pulling it along the length of it. A long, white, feminine hand protruded from the gap I'd made, falling to the floor with a bone thump. It doesn't look like nothing to me, I said. Why don't you tell me what you're really up to, Dr. Weber? I aided him in carrying the corpse of a dismembered woman to his apartment and pushed the bag along the wall near the rest. How many women were there? I couldn't tell you. I am on the verge of a groundbreaking scientific discovery. I can beat death. He dabbed at his furrowed brow with a handkerchief. You must understand. I did. And so it went every night following that, I helped the good doctor pick out a corpse to dig up and deposit in the apartment. Never once did his madness allot him the lucidity to ask why I helped. To be honest, I'm the kind of person that likes to take things as they come. I just wanted to see what would happen. One night, Weber called me over to his unit and offered me a bit of tea. He was on edge. He was on the verge of something very big, I could tell. No more bodies. I don't need any more bodies. I have the equipment. I have what I need. I must only flip the switch, he said with his index finger in the air. His voice was shaky and his hands had trouble keeping his own teacup from spilling over. After the tea, I followed Weber over to a door near his kitchen, a door that I'd yet to see in my own unit. I assume there's none other like it in any of the apartments, either. As the door swung in, I saw behind it a staircase, leading down into a regular old Frankenstein lair. I followed him down into the concrete basement. There were an array of many different mechanical contraptions I'd never seen before. Some wires sparked alive in the corner as he snapped a light on overhead. It's been years, but I have the recipe just right. He was very excited. The ceiling was a mishmash of metal sheets. Computer monitors along a wall blooped alive with all kinds of readings I was unable to understand. Are you ready, my Igor? He asked me. Uh, sure, 
I said aloud, not truly believing it. Whoever wrapped his dress shoes along the concrete as he went to the center of the room where a table with a sheet over it rested. He removed the sheet in a broad sweep and smiled down upon his grotesque creation. "'Twas a woman that lay there. Not any regular woman, mind you. She was made of flesh and bone, constructed from a wide variety of skin tones all sewn together. Her hair was, well, it was obviously dead and stuck out stiff and wild from beneath a metal bowl helmet that looked as though it had been crafted from a colander. He put on a pair of goggles over his glasses and threw me a pair. I donned the shaded goggles and watched the doctor prepare for what came next by slipping his hands into a pair of rubber dish gloves. He moved to the wall where there was a long wooden switch. Here we go! He heaved the switch downward. The wiring stretching from the switch to the dead woman's helmet twitched alive and whipped to and fro. The corpse stayed motionless upon the table. The doctor gritted his teeth. Son of a bitch! He stammered, pushing the switch up again. It should have worked this time. Mm, try again. I'm not sure what forced these words out of my throat, but they came out nonetheless. He looked over at me, putting his gloved hands back on the switch doubtfully. Again, the wire shot alive. This time, so did the woman's eyes. One brown, the other black. Her limbs danced all around her sporadically, and for a moment I was afraid the damn things would fly right off her body. I could smell burning flesh and hair. She's alive! shouted Weber, pushing the switch back to its resting position. I'd be lying if I said this didn't force a chuckle out of my tired body. This was quite a scientific breakthrough, wasn't it? He scrambled to her side, swiping his goggles off his forehead. He held her delicate small hand in his glove. My darling, my beautiful darling, I've brought you back. The reanimated woman's unfocused eyes met his, and her free hand went to his cheek. He pushed into it like a lover. Ambrose? she asked. I can't fully explain what happened next. A spray of blood spewed from the good doctor's neck and into the air. Adrenaline shot through my body like a bullet, and I could feel my joints ache from it. Weber fell to the concrete floor, squirming as blood pooled beneath him. The woman popped the colander helmet off her head and moved to a nearby workbench. She brandished a hammer and went back at the poor doctor. Her red smile shone in the fluorescent lights that hung overhead as she brought the hammer down over his head. The doctor's limbs shot out stiffly in all directions, much like hers had only moments before, and then he was still. My legs carried me up the wooden steps, but I cared to take one last glance backward and saw her scraping pink brains into her mouth like a wild cave woman. My stomach tingled. I slammed and locked the door leading down there behind me and vomited into my outstretched hand. It's been an hour now. She speaks to me through the door. She tells me she didn't mean to. She tells me I smell good through the door. She says I smell better than Ambrose. I can hear her nails scrape the wooden panel of the door. I know she won't stay down there forever. I know she'll get me sooner or later. Who can I turn to? No one. Even now she calls to me and begs to be set free. And so I wait for her, totally helpless. My biology class was packed to the brim for the first time since the beginning of the semester. I looked around to see several faces who hadn't been present for the majority of my lectures. And yet, they had all decided to join the class today. No surprise there. The entire science department was abuzz with talk of my special guest. My brother-in-law, Mark, worked at NASA. He had volunteered to come in and give a talk to inspire the kids. He wanted to share something with them that would excite them, to get them interested in space exploration, just like he had been inspired by Carl Sagan and others like him when he was a kid. If we don't get these kids off their phones and looking into telescopes, who the hell's gonna get us to Mars? This planet isn't gonna last forever, Mark was fond of saying. It was odd to see him standing there at the front of my class, decked out in his Nassau blues. 
I felt an absurd moment of pride, thinking about how I was related to him. Mark brought a vial of something with him, and he acted very mysterious about it, keeping it locked in a steel briefcase. It wasn't immediately clear to me what it was, but after some prodding, he revealed that it was never meant to leave the laboratory. My boss owes me a favor, he told me before the students came in. This is a grain of material recovered from an asteroid. It was collected by a Japanese mission which landed on the surface. We got a few pieces from them in a trade. That's incredible, I said, eyeing the briefcase. Can I see? Not yet, he replied, smiling. You gotta wait for show and tell, just like the rest of the class. Luckily, I didn't have to wait for long. As the bell rang and the last student filed in, looking awkwardly for an empty desk and not finding one. <clears throat> I cleared my throat. Is anybody in this classroom not supposed to be here right now? After a few moments of uncomfortable silence, two students and one red-faced teacher stood up, giving up their chairs for those who were actually supposed to be in my class. If you have a spare period and you want to stay for the presentation, that's fine, I told them, holding back a smile but you'll have to stand at the back if there's no seats left. Finally, everyone settled in, and I presented our guest speaker. All right, class, I told you we'd have a special guest today, so let's get straight to it. This is my brother-in-law, Mark. He works in a lab at NASA, examining samples from outer space. And he brought something to show us. Uh, take it away, Mark. My brother-in-law stepped forward. The kids became utterly still and silent as he spoke, carrying his ominous shiny steel briefcase. Hello, everyone, he said, explaining his job and background at NASA. But nobody was really listening. They all just wanted to know what was in the briefcase. Finally, he began to open it. This is a sample from an asteroid that the Japanese Space Agency landed a probe on. Over at NASA, we were desperate to get our hands on this stuff so that we could examine it. Uh, so we actually traded for it. Just like you kids with your... Pokemon cards? There were a few stifled laughs, and he glanced at me awkwardly. I shook my head as discreetly as I could. Or baseball cards, whatever. Magic? Is that still a thing? Anyways, this is what we got for our trade. The class was silent again as he pulled out a vial with a couple small grains in it. This came from that asteroid way out in outer space. Wow. The class responded, mostly in unison again. One or two kids didn't appear impressed, but most did. Is that it? One boy named Justin asked from the back of the class. Looks like you just picked up some asphalt off the road. Justin had missed most of my lessons so far, and his grades were indicative of this lack of effort. It was also his second time taking Biology 201. That didn't stop him from acting like a smartass, though. What exactly does this have to do with biology, anyways? He continued. Seems like you just made up some reason to play astronaut for a day. Because you're bored of playing teacher. My face began to turn red at the remark, but I did my best to stay calm. It was difficult, but I tried not to let this ruin the presentation. Justin, if you want to interrupt our guest one more time, you'll be staying after class for the rest of the week. Do I make myself clear? Whatever, man. He put his feet up on the desk and closed his eyes pretending to go to sleep. Feet off the desk. He ignored me. Now. Finally, he complied, giving me a death stare as he did, then dropping his feet to the floor with a loud stomp. Mark gave me an awkward glance, as if asking if he could continue, while simultaneously asking how I could put up with such nonsense on a daily basis. I nodded my head, feeling exhausted, and told him to continue. As he explained about the surface of the asteroid, he gave the front row of students the glass tube to examine. I was nervous as the specimen made its way around the class, slowly moving towards Justin at the back of the room. I couldn't help but wonder if he would try to do something with it. The hairs began to stand up on the back of my neck as it got close to him, and his eyes peeled open from their pretend sleep, glancing at the tube as it came within arm's reach. Before it was even his turn, he snatched it from the hand of the student in front of him, who called out, sounding annoyed. Hey, I wasn't done with it. Mark was interrupted again by this outburst, and I started marching over towards Justin, feeling my face turning red with anger. 
Not only that, but I was nervous as hell, wondering what he might do with the priceless specimen. He turned the glass tube in his hand, spinning the grains around as he examined them. All the while, he pretended to ignore me as I came towards him. Man, what a load of bullshit. This is fake, he said, throwing the glass tube across the room towards the sink. No! Mark yelled, terrified as the glass tube sailed through the air. It shattered on impact, despite the heavy-duty glass, as it hit the corner of a steel countertop in the worst spot possible. The force of pressure broke it on impact, and the minute particles inside fell to the water-slick floor. Mark ran over to the place where they'd fallen, sifting through the broken glass, getting down on his knees as he picked through the pieces. He looked desperate and on the verge of tears as he rifled through the shards of broken glass, his fingers getting cut on the small pieces. Where are they? He was yelling, his face pressed up close to the linoleum tiles. I pulled Justin up by his arm, dragging him towards the door of the class as he protested. How could anyone be so thoughtless and so cruel, so childish and so stupid? You're going to get expelled for this. This is the last straw, Justin. I can't believe you just did that. He was screaming about abuse and how I was hurting him, despite the fact that I was being very gentle with him. I just ignored him and got ready to open the door to the class, to take him to the principal's office. But then I noticed something. Mark was on the floor, blood dripping from his fingers. But something was happening in that pool of red fluid. It was swirling and moving around, as if being pulled by some invisible force. Like there was a mini hurricane brewing in that concoction of blood and water, tears and tiny space particles. It looked like that mixture was coming alive, like the primordial ooze at the infancy of life. What the hell? I muttered, looking down at it. I felt drawn towards it suddenly, letting go of Justin as I stumbled towards the swirling mass. The red rivulets of blood had turned into amorphous blobs. These began to grow larger and expand, enveloping more blood and debris, growing bigger and bigger like macrophages or certain types of slime mold. Mark, what's going on? I whispered, moving towards him, wanting to pull him away from the strange phenomenon. He didn't say anything, and the tendrils of swirling red slime began to merge and grow bigger, until it was a quivering, shimmering mass of goo, nearly the size of a basketball. It was slightly oblong, and I realized it looked like a giant, slimy ostrich egg. Suddenly, the egg thing reached out with a tendril of slime. Mark jumped to his feet and recoiled backwards as it snapped back to its original shape. It had tried to reach out and touch him, as if aware of his presence. Then it began to flatten out and expand again. After a few seconds, it was the size of a towel, and then a blanket, as it pooled and expanded like a volcano discharging lava from deep within its core. But the substance wasn't coming from beneath the surface. It was multiplying rapidly, growing bigger and bigger like a super virus out of control, replicating faster and faster. What the hell is that thing? I screamed, backing away from it. Now it was blocking the only exit to the room, with Justin trapped on the other side. It's organic, Mark managed to say. We thought it was just space dust, but it... It must have been in suspended animation up there. Whatever that is, we just woke it up. We watered it and fed it and we let it out. What the hell was I thinking bringing it here? The blob was getting larger and larger, creeping outwards insidiously. Mark pulled his phone from his pocket, then hit a button. He spoke rapidly into the cell phone and I could tell we weren't getting out of this place in time for dinner. Not today. The CDC and NASA arrived quickly and worked together, quarantining the school. Despite the lack of windows in my classroom, we could hear the sirens outside. My brother-in-law was also keeping me updated on what was happening. Meanwhile, we remained trapped inside the room, blocked off from the exit, as the slimy organism grew larger and larger. The worst part was that Justin, the terrible student who had broken the vial, was trapped between the door and the rest of the class. The organism had spread quickly outwards, climbing up the door like vines before he could get away. Now Justin was trapped in the corner of the room, like a kid in a timeout, 
as the vein-like edges of the red slime spread out towards him, creeping closer and closer. I don't like it. I don't like it. He kept repeating, sitting on the floor with his back against the wall, his legs pulled close. Soon it was just an inch away from him, and reaching out towards him greedily. Justin jumped to his feet, trying to maintain distance from the alien life form. Please make it stop, I'm sorry. He was yelling, becoming hysterical as the goo inched closer. Don't let it touch me! Don't let it touch me! He began to scream, his words devolving into shrill cries of terror as the red slime began to crawl up onto his shoes, inching vine-like towards his socks as he tried to pull away. As it touched his skin, he began to melt and blend and change, morphing into something else. Something alien. The transformation happened over hours, as Mark called his bosses at NASA with increasing desperation. Meanwhile, the red, veiny slime continued to spread, growing up the walls and onto the ceiling, as my students and I retreated further and further into the corner of the classroom. Justin was no longer recognizable as a human being anymore. His form completely dissolved into the puddle of red slime. I wondered if he was still in there somewhere, alive in the mixture of expanding red goo. And then I saw the eyeball, poking out from the slimy ceiling. And I saw the teeth, breaking into a familiar crooked grin. You wanted to punish me? To kick me out of school? The voice sounded like it was in agony. Each word was desperate and anguished. A second later, the eyeball was peering out from a different place on the ceiling, looking down at Mark and speaking in Justin's voice. You did this to me. This is your fault. Tendrils of red slime reached down from the ceiling towards my brother-in-law, pulling him up from the ground effortlessly and enveloping him head first. His screams were cut short and his kicking legs ceased moving as his body was pulled up into the red, slithering mass inch by inch. The entire room was now almost completely covered in the slime, and it quivered and bulged all around us like the peristalsis of some great snake ingesting a meal. Mark's feet disappeared into the ceiling, as if he'd been pulled into another dimension. But then his voice spoke from the wall beside me. Why did you tell me to come here? You caused this. It was you. Mark's voice had merged with Justin and become something else, blending with the darkness of this alien creature and his growing contempt for us. I enjoy devouring you the most, Justin Mark said, more teeth appearing on the wall and a crooked smile. I'm going to save you for last. The red slime is still spreading, inching slowly towards us. Who knows if Nassau will come to save us in time, or if they will just leave us here to die. Maybe a thermonuclear weapon or some napalm would be easier, and they'll decide to go with that option instead. Honestly, my students and I would probably welcome that, over the ooze which is slowly preparing to ingest us. So please, if anyone from the government gets a hold of this, take us out, by any means necessary. Before we become a part of it. Before we become its next meal. The story you just heard was written by me, and a variation of it previously featured on the Dr. No Sleep podcast and YouTube channel. If you'd like to check out their channel for more content, please check out the description below. My eyes stung with dry pain, and I rubbed them with my palms trying to massage the last bit of moisture into them from the insides of my eyelids. Like wringing out a sponge that's been sitting in the desert sun, there was little benefit. Still, I continued to stare at the computer screen in my home office, waiting for the final calculations to finish. If I was right about this, the dark silhouette of a planet I had been staring at for the last two days was really capable of harboring life. Maybe even intelligent life. The thought seemed surreal and dreamlike, further evidence of my exhausted state. 
It couldn't really be happening. It just wasn't possible, was it? A second later, the status bar showed complete, and the calculations were finally done. I began to read through the results, showing temperature variations and percentages of various compounds. Reading down from the top, my heart began to hammer faster and faster in my chest. Nitrogen, 78%. Oxygen, 20.9%. Argon, 0.9%. Carbon dioxide, 0.03%. Additional gases, see further breakdown below, 0.17%. Median temperature, 58.43 degrees Fahrenheit. It was impossible. The composition of the atmosphere, the temperature, the size of the planet and its proximity to its star, which just so happened to be a G-type yellow dwarf main sequence star, all of these features, they were identical to Earth. Which meant I just discovered the one planet every astronomer had dreamed of finding. The unicorn. The Goldilocks. The twin to our one-of-a-kind blue speck in the middle of an impossibly vast ocean that is space. If there was one place among the stars that could harbor intelligent life, this was it. I sent an email to my superiors telling them what I discovered, but it bounced back, saying undeliverable. After several more attempts, I tried calling, but the line was always busy, no matter who I dialed. Frustrated and exhausted, I decided to wait until morning. The cell service in this area of Hawaii was notoriously terrible, so I'd try from a landline the next day. I hadn't slept in 48 hours, and it was all catching up with me at once as my eyelids grew heavy and I wandered into the bedroom, collapsing onto the mattress. I fell asleep a second after my head hit the pillow, and I drifted into a deep sleep filled with mysterious dreams of lost stars and hidden planets. I awoke to the sight of a bright bluish-white light. It glared at me from the end of my bed, an opening like a giant mouth. A silhouette emerged from the light, and then another. Just like the planet I'd been watching through the telescope for so long, the figures blocked out a portion of that light, but only momentarily. And then there were hands roughly grabbing me and yanking me up from the warmth of my bed, pulling me across the floor with my feet dragging abrasively along the rough carpeting. Hey, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? I shouted, thrashing as I came back to alert wakefulness. They said nothing, only gripping me tighter as we drew closer to the blue, swirling vortex of glowing light. We went into the portal and I felt extremely warm, then extremely cold, but only for a brief moment until we came out the other side. Two robed figures stood before me, and I saw that we were on a rooftop overlooking a vast city. The buildings were towering, their features angular and sharp. Their highly reflective surfaces were tinged pink and blue, and I suddenly realized why they looked so bizarre. We're there, aren't we? On the planet I just discovered. The figure standing before me didn't say anything. They only stared blankly at me. As I observed the foreign planet in wonderment, I saw that the aliens who lived there were far more advanced than humans on Earth. This looked like a city from Star Wars. Floating spacecraft docked and took off from ports built into massive skyscrapers. These gargantuan towers extended thousands of feet into the air, disappearing into the clouds above. Floating spacecraft of all sizes and shapes were traveling through the city, alighting on these docks like bees pollinating flowers. How did you know I found you? I asked. Can you even understand me? They didn't answer. You must be able to understand me if you could read my emails and intercept them. Why didn't you want my superiors to know about this place? Without responding, the taller of the two hooded figures nodded down to the streets far below us. I looked over the precipice and saw activity beneath us. A city full of life and aliens going about their day-to-day -day business. I couldn't make out much in detail 
through the haze of smog, but it looked dim and dreary down below. There was a noise, and a flash of light, and we were suddenly standing there at street level. The aliens had advanced technology that allowed us to teleport through space in an instant, and they deployed it readily, it seemed. No walking around for these creatures. No elevators or stairs, either. Vehicles which hovered above the ground at various levels packed the open air above the street. I looked up and saw that, despite the added third dimension being employed to ease congestion, that traffic jams were still occurring. Each level of flying cars was honking, and there were creatures leaning out the windows of their vehicles, barking in an alien tongue, and gesturing with tentacles covered in fish-hooked claws on one side. Street vendors were selling paper plates filled with foul-smelling meat to customers who had lined up to purchase lunch. A dozen or more were standing near us, and I was careful to stay close to the hooded figures who were acting as my guides. The creatures of this planet were tall, wide, and gelatinous. They had probeses instead of mouths and tentacles instead of arms and legs, which they used to propel themselves. Similar to how octopuses move in a myriad of different ways, some of them walked on their back tentacles, almost like bipedal humans, while others slithered and moved snake-like across the pavement. They also changed colors, I noticed, depending on the background behind them. Surprisingly, none of them seemed to notice as the three of us stood watching them silently from a shaded spot near a building. The hooded figure standing next to me raised an extremity which was shrouded in robes. I looked where they were pointing and saw something very odd. A man was coming out of the sewer grate in the middle of the street. Hovering cars were honking at him and splashing him with mud as they sped past. He seemed not to notice. His face was calm and passive, and there was a collar around his neck covered in blinking lights. What the hell? I muttered, watching him go about his duties. He was bringing buckets of brown, slimy muck up from the sewers. His face and clothing were smeared in it, and I could smell the disgusting stench from where we stood, at least thirty yards away. Why is there a person here? I asked the hooded figures. There can't be a person here. We're further away from Earth than any spacecraft is capable of traveling. Assuming we are where I think we are. Then, a moment later, we teleported again. We were no longer on street level, but instead we were far below ground in a dark mine. The sound of pickaxes, chisels, and hammers could be heard over the cacophony of voices, and mine carts which traveled across nearby rails. The voices were human, I realized, and we drew closer to see a group of men working at the walls with crude tools. Each one had the same collar covered in blinking lights, snugly secured around their necks. They were the same collars as the one I had seen the man wearing up on street level. Their faces were calm and passive, none of them looking angry or upset. Instead, they wore no expression at all. As they loaded up mine carts full of rock material, I saw that once they were full, they would send them off down the tracks. More carts would come to take their place, and they would fill those up, sending them off down the track as well, in a never-ending monotony of movements. The men and women worked tirelessly, and none of them seemed to stop for an instant to rest. I looked at my guides, beginning to grow angry. What is this place? What are you doing to these people? The hooded figures looked at each other and nodded, then turned back to me and revealed their faces. My guides were human, but they looked different, battle-scarred and branded with strange numeric tattoos and barcodes which covered their skin. The one on the left was a man, the one on the right a woman. Both had shaved heads and brown eyes. We needed to show you what will happen if you contact your superiors about this planet. If we didn't, then this timeline would become prime. Trust me, you don't want that. I looked back and forth between their unreadable faces, then again at the hordes of human servants being forced by giant aliens into servitude. I was terrified, but the scientist in me needed to know what all of this meant. 
And I'll admit, looking back, my pride was badly wounded just thinking about denouncing my findings. They were huge. I had discovered another planet, one capable of supporting life in the most optimal conditions imaginable. Not only that, but there actually was life on this planet. What are you saying? I can't tell anyone about my findings or else this will happen? Oh, let me guess. This is a simulation or, or a hallucination or something like that, right? This isn't even real. This is very real. This is the future if you choose to continue on the path you have chosen. Despite what you may think, this will come to pass within your lifetime. If you do not follow what we tell you. I thought about this for a minute. I, I, I can't. I can't keep this discovery to myself. I, I just can't. I live by a code as a scientist, and I cannot break that code. I can't just keep something like this a secret. But don't worry. We won't try to contact this other planet. We'll, we'll just observe it, okay? I'll be sure of that. The man turned to look at the woman. You were right. He's too stupid to save. No matter what we do, he'll tell them what he found. She sighed. I regret to say you're right, Zandak. We'll have to leave him here. She snapped her fingers, and I noticed that a slight hissing sound which had been surrounding me without my notice was suddenly gone. Like when the power goes out, you realize how quiet it is without the fridge running. The aliens and all the humans nearby turned to look at me, and I realized they could see me now. He is trying to escape, one of the men nearby said, blandly and with no emotion. His collar blinked yellow, then green, making a pleasant chiming noise. His eyes rolled back in his head as if he had just received a boost of dopamine to his brain. I will stop him, a woman near me said, reaching out to grab hold of me. He is tall and looks strong. He will be a good worker for the mines. I pulled away from her and several others started moving in towards me, from all around. Help, please, come, I won't say anything, just let me go back, I want to go back. I screamed, trying to get back into the faint, hazy blue bubble surrounding my hosts. The people who had brought me to this place could no longer be seen inside, but I imagined them shaking their heads. I'll tell them this planet is a wasteland, un uninhabitable, please, just let me go back. They seemed to consider this. After a few long moments, just as the dirty hands of mining prisoners all around me were about to grab hold of me, they pulled me back into the protective bubble of invisibility. Once I was back inside, they looked at me sternly, and the woman began to speak. We are from the future, even past this one. When humans stand up against their captive overlords and begin to fight back. Unfortunately, we are outnumbered and outgunned. However, we have managed to gain one advantage. A mission to capture several pieces of enemy technology allowed us this one opportunity. This one chance to go back in time and fix things. Now that you've seen it firsthand, you must understand why you cannot share your findings about this planet with anyone. For as long as you live. You must keep this place a secret. The man said gravely. I will. Look, I can see now that this is real and that you're trying to protect us from contacting these creatures for a reason, I said, too terrified to argue with them. We all talked about this possibility amongst each other in the break room, in the lab, around the computers while we looked at images of planets we discovered. The question was on all of our minds. What if we find intelligent life, but it turns out they're much more advanced? What if they're a super predator and they don't want to share this universe with anyone else? That is exactly why you must keep this a secret. I repeat, you cannot tell anyone about your discovery. If you do, this is what will become of the human race. We will live in chains for a hundred years. And perhaps much longer. He snapped his fingers, and I found myself back in bed. In my home once again. It was morning, and birds were chirping outside my window. The possibility occurred to me that it all could have been a nightmare. It felt so real, I thought to myself. But it wasn't a dream. I was sure of that after seeing the bruises on my arms from where the future humans had roughly grabbed me. 
but still. My discovery was too big to ignore. I couldn't just let it go to waste. I went over to my desk again and looked at the unsent email from the night before, which I tried to send to my boss. The coordinates of the planet and the makeup of its atmosphere. So similar to Earth. It was all right there. Waiting to be seen. I couldn't help myself. I hit the send button. I know some of you will be upset with me, but... You don't understand. This discovery is going to be huge. It's going to change the world. It's going to change everything. I was racing down the Trans-Canada Highway in the middle of the night. In the middle of nowhere, to be frank. And I was getting hungry. The bear hates being hungry. According to Google, there was no food nor gas stations in sight. The bear was displeased. My real name is Bob Bryson. I'm a big rig driver living in Edmonton, Alberta. But everyone calls me the bear. You can probably guess why. Deep down, I'm a good guy. I love the Grateful Dead, and I play a mean blues harp on the weekends. But I have a nasty side. Especially when I'm hungry. Typically, on these long hauls, my girlfriend Wendy packs three square meals for me, and that should be sufficient. Unfortunately, I devour those scrumptious sandwiches within the first few hours of driving, leaving me foodless and underfed. I flip through the radio. All I could find was late-night Jesus freaks and country music. I need satellite radio in this old freight shaker, I told myself. I hate shitty music. I also hate driving this late at night in lonely Manitoba. All you get to look at out here are these strange yellow crops. And I don't eat those yellow crops. What the hell are they used for anyhow? I could care less. I want food. There was no stopping for the night and my coffee thermos was empty. There's nowhere to even get a cup of coffee out here. I hate the prairies with a passion. Nice folks out here though. One lone car drove past me then it was gone and the highway was again stark and desolate. I continued flipping through the radio stations. I need satellite radio, I grumbled again, slamming my meaty fist into the steering wheel a little too hard. My giant stomach screamed, Feed me now, in protest. It was becoming an emergency. All I could see was miles upon miles of flat prairie road. Ah, the Canadian prairies. I spotted some peculiar lights up ahead. No freaking way, I said aloud. I rubbed my eyes. Up ahead was a brightly lit building with an open sign flashing. I don't remember seeing this place here before. I pulled into the empty parking lot and eased the big truck to a stop. There's no way this place is open. According to the red and white neon flashing sign, the place was called Lickety Split. It was an old-fashioned 50s-style diner. How original. I said. But, as my ma used to say, a hungry bear must eat. I got out of the truck and farted. I needed to pee, and judging by the smell of that fart, I needed to take a dump. I meandered towards the door. Something about this place gave me the creeps. I considered going back for my gun, but ultimately I kept going. This was an emergency. I considered looking the place up on my smartphone, but couldn't get any Wi-Fi, and I was too hungry to care. As long as the place is actually open, I'll do just fine. I worried it would be closed. Some asshole probably left the sign on by accident. I tried the door. It opened. I went inside. I've spent the rest of my life wishing that I hadn't. The smell of meat and grease was like sex to my nose. My tremendous tummy rumbled in anticipation. I headed straight for the men's room and stayed in there for over ten minutes. Finally, I flushed, washed up, and hurried out. Let's hope no one goes in there anytime soon. I was the only customer in the diner and had yet to see an employee. There was a tiny bell next to the vintage-style cash register. I rang it impatiently. After a minute or so, an employee came out. He was a tall, pimply kid with an otherwise handsome young face. His uniform made him look ridiculous. Look at the lickety-split, 
the cashier said without enthusiasm. Can I take your order? Uh, I don't know. Can you? I asked, checking the menu. The prices were incredibly cheap. How lucky was I to have discovered this place? The cashier was tapping his fingers anxiously. His eyes were shifting back and forth. I finally made up my mind. I'll go with the cheeseburger combo with a large Coke. I better make that a double, I'm hungry. The employee punched the order into the ancient looking cash register, took my money, then quickly disappeared, leaving me all alone. The diner was fairly small. It had checkered board floors, cherry red vinyl seats, white chrome trimmed tables, and a stainless steel backsplash. The walls were littered with typical 1950s era memorabilia. I was digging the Wurlitzer jukebox next to the counter. I checked my watch. Fifteen minutes had passed. What's taking so long? I rang the bell. At long last, the pimply kid returned holding two steaming paper bags of food. The smell was delicious. I snatched the bags of food and left in a hurry. As I headed toward the exit, I felt as though I was being watched. I couldn't leave fast enough. I glanced over my shoulder as I pushed open the door just in case. The pimply kid was gone. The diner was empty. I shook my head and left. I fired up the engine and sifted through the radio stations, until I gave up on finding anything decent. Instead, I reached greedily into the bag of food, pulled out a cheeseburger, and ate it in three bites. I belched, then washed it down with my Coke. It was cold and sweet and good. I wiped my face and reached back into the bag looking for fries. Damn it all to hell. They forgot my fries. My big fist was clenched. My teeth started to grind. Should I go back in for my fries? I didn't know the answer. Yes, I was hungry, and yes, I paid for those damn fries, but something about the diner spooked me. And the bear wasn't easily spooked. In fact, the last time I was spooked, I was tripping on LSD many wonderful years ago. Ah, the hell with it. I grumbled, and reached for the other burger. There wasn't enough time. I needed to reach Winnipeg ASAP. I pulled the 18-wheeler back onto the empty highway and started to drive away. As the truck began speeding up, Bad Moon Rising came on the radio. That's more like it. I reached for the volume. My second cheeseburger had one large bite taken from it, which I was still chewing. Up ahead, a bright light approached as another transport truck drove past. I held my burger up to my face and was just about to devour it. When the light of the truck peered into my cab, and I noticed a fingertip mashed into the burger meat. I screamed and dropped the burger onto my lap. Hot grease scorched my crotch. I hollered, slammed on the brakes, and pulled the truck over. Quickly, I examined the burger. Then I rolled down the window and puked. Chunks of fleshy meat dripped down the side of the door. Inside the burger was human flesh. There was no denying it. That's it. I'm going back. Only a skilled driver can maneuver an 18-wheeler the way I can, and soon I was heading back towards Lickety Split, looking to kick some ass. When I pulled into the parking lot, the sign was turned off. Oh, no, you don't. I began hammering on the window. Let me in, you creep. I continued pounding until the cashier came over. His hands were shaky, and he was no longer in uniform. I held up my half-eaten flesh burger in my hand and waved it like a maniac. The kid's eyes bulged in alarm. He quickly turned away and split. Hey, don't you leave me here. I want another burger. And my fries. I said this without much thought. I still believed it was some sort of mishap, plus I really wanted those fries. I checked my watch. I don't have time for this. I'm running late. And the bear is never late. Moments later, a tall, hefty man, nearly my size, approached the door. He was wearing a filthy chef's uniform. He looked like the Swedish chef from the Muppets. Only sinister. I laughed, despite myself. Open up. The chef stood stupidly at the door, brandishing a butcher's knife. His ghastly white face was round and plump, his dark, beady eyes inquisitive. He made a quick assessment, then opened the door. I spilled inside the diner and demanded an explanation. 
The chef smiled pleasantly, but spoke in Swedish. I didn't have the capacity, nor the time, to ponder why someone from Sweden had suddenly opened a diner in the middle of Manitoba. But I hated this man from the get-go. Explain this. I tossed the half-eaten burger at the chef. The human finger was as visible as my substantial stomach. The chef turned and shouted, smiled again, then ran into the kitchen. By now, my adrenaline was on max. I was ready to rumble. With two clenched fists, I followed the chef into the kitchen. I immediately wished I hadn't. The kitchen was filthy. Large, fleshy bones lay haphazardly on the countertop. The floor was caked in grease and discarded vegetable scraps. A small, round-looking man popped out of the walk-in fridge and shrieked with surprise. He spoke loudly in Swedish. Two more men appeared, holding large kitchen knives. I reached for my gun. It was still in the truck. How could I be so stupid? Before I could react, I was clocked from behind and knocked unconscious. Pain. Searing pain and white light. White light and voices. More pain. Confusion. I tried to open my eyes. I couldn't. I tried to move. I couldn't. There were voices all around me. I grumbled and roared. Swick, swick, swick. The hell was that sound? I knew as soon as the question came. Knives sharpening. I could smell rotting meat. I was bitterly cold and the air was thin and difficult to breathe. Panic hit me. I tried desperately to move, but couldn't. Okay, I told myself. Best be careful. I heard muffled voices talking rapidly. The sound of sharpening knives intensified. I couldn't see, my eyes were covered. I squinted and shifted my face until I managed to remove the face covering. I was inside a long walk-in fridge, surrounded by a buffet of disfigured animal carcasses. A skinned cat lay next to me. Looks like Puffy the cat won't be returning home anytime soon. Its hind legs had been chopped off and its eyeballs were removed. All the shelves were covered in random animal carcasses, most of which I could not identify. I was too angry to be upset. I needed a plan and fast. My hands had been tied behind my back with what I suspected was duct tape. I tried breaking free. I couldn't. My eyes began to adjust to the darkness. The white light was coming from behind the door, which hadn't been properly shut. I tried and tried to stand up, but I was woozy. They had drugged me. Lucky for me, however, years of following fish on tour had given me an almost supernatural tolerance to narcotics. Still, I couldn't find my feet, so I crawled. My long, fat fingers were clutching desperately for anything I could use to free myself. Until, alas, I was holding something. I couldn't see what it was, but I already knew. I was holding some sort of animal bone. It was long and pointy. It would do the trick. I spent a half hour trying to saw myself out of those duct-taped shackles. I worked fervently until, snap, my hands were free. Now I could help myself stand up. I did, and hit my head on a human carcass hanging from the ceiling. Its feet and hands were gone. The smell was repulsive even in the cold. I didn't care. I was ready to kick ass and take names. I searched for a weapon and found a large animal bone with a sharp pointed tip. This should suffice. I imagined what I looked like and laughed. Probably like Fred Flintstone holding a giant animal bone. Only, Fred wasn't ever in this kind of danger. The talking stopped suddenly. I leaned against the door, listening, ready to attack whoever was unlucky enough to open the door. The chef shouted an order. I heard cluttering and pots and pans clanking. Just before the refrigerator door swung open, I noticed more human remains lying at the end of the fridge. A large rat was feasting on a human foot. I looked away and tightened my grip on the bone. I heard more talking. Then the refrigerator door swung open. Three cooks, brandishing the largest knives I've ever seen, surrounded me immediately. I went into a frenzy and attacked all of them at once. The shorter man went down like a sack of potatoes. I knocked him out with a good clunk on the side of his head. Another man stabbed me in the ribs. I howled. 
then grabbed the cook by his scrawny neck and squeezed the life out of him. The cook collapsed. I bellowed in triumph. Blood was dripping from my side, but I didn't notice. The third man sneaked up behind me and slipped on my blood and crashed into the stainless steel kitchen counter and whacked his head on his way down. I immediately pounced. I kicked the pathetic-looking cook in the face again and again and again until he was no longer recognizable. Shit had gotten personal. Three dead or unconscious men lay in the greasy, vomitous kitchen. Blood was everywhere. A large soup pot was simmering tomorrow's soup of the day and half-chopped vegetables were scattered along the stained red cutting board. I heard a sound coming from outside the kitchen. The Swedish chef. There was no way that asshole was escaping. I reached for my phone, but my pockets had been picked. Instead, I tossed aside the bone I was holding and replaced it with the sharpest-looking knife in the kitchen. Something told me this was the knife they had planned on murdering me with. Fat chance. I found the cleanest rag I could find and pressed it tightly against my wounds. It immediately hurt. The cut wasn't deep. I'll live. Knife in hand, I crouched beside the swinging door leading into the kitchen. Strange and unusual noises were coming from the other side. The Swedish chef sounded frantic. Come out, come out, wherever you are, I sang. The sound of my voice scared the hell out of me. I waited. The door finally swung open and the Swedish chef appeared. He was holding a Smith & Wesson, the same gun that I had stashed in my glove compartment of my truck. The chef struck me on the chin. I fell backwards, slipped on a discarded french fry and fell on my ass. Oh, now I get my fries. The chef pointed the gun at me and smiled. You've been a bad boy, Bob, but you'll make a fine soup. Say goodbye, Bob. His accent made him sound like a James Bond villain. Nobody calls me Bob. How cute. The force of firing the gun caused him to slip and fall. He fired too high and missed. Next time, clean your floors. I pounced. I easily subdued the Swedish chef and beat the living shit out of him until there was nothing left but another bloodied carcass. My fists were pulverized. This didn't bother me. I finished off the other hapless cooks laying unconscious on the dirty kitchen floor. I'd never seen so much blood and guts and gore. I was about to leave the deathly diner, but instead decided to stay. Before driving a transport truck for a living, I had been a short order cook. I knew a thing or two about making a fine soup. I quickly went to work. The warm prairie sun came up a few hours later, and a tired looking teenage girl, clad in her silly red uniform, walked into the kitchen. Who the hell are you? She asked me. I'm the new cook. I was wearing a clean apron. Whatever, the waitress said. What's the soup of the day? I grinned. A twinkle formed in my bloodshot eyes as I spoke. Swedish meatball soup. When my wife and I first moved into the house, I wasn't sure what to make of the strange lights. I thought at first they were passing cars, or people parking at the side of the road. Teenagers looking for a place to get high or make out. Or worse, hunters trespassing on our land. I even walked out there to confront them one night, thinking these people had no right to be harassing us like they were. That night, when I saw the lights, I started marching out there purposefully, despite the late hour. There were no crickets chirping and nothing was making a sound. Everything was dead quiet as I stepped closer to that glowing round light at the edge of our property. And then I blinked and it was just gone. Thinking still that it was just teenagers or drunks who had seen me and turned their lights off, I kept walking out further, the eerie quiet and the moonless night making me uneasy as I approached the tree line. There was no way a car could have vanished so quickly. And yet, when I got to the road, it was empty. It was as if the source of the strange light had just disappeared. Vanished into thin air. And worse than that, I felt eyes on the back of my neck as I stood out there, blind and weaponless in the darkness, having brought nothing to defend myself. 
leaves crunched underfoot, and I spun around to see the dark shape of something hiding just behind a tree, a few yards away. It was shadowy and humanoid, ducking out of sight when I looked. The feeling of dread I was experiencing intensified a thousandfold as soon as I caught sight of it. Something you should know about me is that I love to read old folklore and mythology, and the old scary stories are my favorite. Immediately, this thing reminded me of something I had read a description of once. A mythological creature. And a terrifying one at that. It reminded me of old folklore tales I had heard of of a creature called the Hide Behind. A being which stalks people in the woods when they're alone and vulnerable. As the name suggests, they hide behind trees and are difficult to spot. No matter which angle you observe them from. They stalk their prey with practiced efficiency and most people die without seeing them coming. I tried to shake away that memory, but could not. As I stared at the thing behind the tree, I felt an inhuman entity looking back at me. I stepped to the side to try to get a better look at it, but the angle I saw of the creature stayed the same. It remained stubbornly hidden behind the tree. Have you ever felt a presence that you recognized immediately was not of our world? Well, silly as that might sound to some people, that's what I felt. Looking at that dark shape hiding behind that tree as it stared back at me, I felt like my heart was going to stop in my chest. My fillings hurt in my teeth and my gut was full of concrete as I turned on my heel and ran from it. Whatever it was. I was so scared I tripped over my own feet, falling hard to the ground and eating dirt on the shoulder of the road. The thing seemed to sense my weakness and it moved out from its hiding place. It didn't step out, it seemed to glide sideways as if floating. It regarded me for an instant longer, then started to close in, its features growing only slightly more discernible as it drew closer. I stumbled to my feet. After taking a few precarious steps and nearly tumbling down into the ditch, I managed to sprint across the field and away from the thing, running faster than I ever had in my life. For a while, I was too afraid to glance over my shoulder, worried that if I did, it would be my death. When I finally did look back, I saw it watching me from the tree line. Its dark form blurred and obscured by shadows, like a picture out of focus. Somehow, I found myself unable to tell my wife what had happened, or anyone for that matter. It felt as if I couldn't as if to do so would make the whole thing real. If I didn't mention it to anyone, it seemed like I could pretend it didn't happen. Like it was just a dream. A week later, it was another quiet night, and my wife and I were out sitting on the front porch, slapping mosquitoes and drinking ice-cold lemonade. She pointed up towards the stars, and I followed her finger to see a small, bluish-white orb moving across the night sky. I thought it was a plane or a satellite so far up in the sky that it seemed insignificant. But then it turned and began heading straight towards us, its trajectory and its growing light causing us to both scream with fear. It crashed down toward us like a meteor about to impact the ranch, its size swelling and its light growing more and more powerful. But then, just as it was about to slam into us with the force of a small sun, it slowed and seemed to inspect us, hovering just a few yards away from us. As the glowing, bluish-white orb regarded us, I felt as if I was dying inside. My bones ached and pain blossomed in my chest and in my throat, my heart drumming too fast inside my chest. I tried to take a breath, but found myself unable as it drew closer and closer to us, its power impossible to ignore. Hovering in front of us, it stayed where it was for a few long moments. The power in the house went out suddenly and it was eerily quiet and dark, except for the light from the orb and its reverberating hum. All I wanted was for it to go away. The feeling of it was so upsetting and so unpleasant it made me feel queasy and sick, and even worse than that in a way I can't describe. It was like a sense of foreboding doom was hanging over me as if an anvil suspended by an old fraying rope were dangling above me. 
I blinked my eyes, and when I opened them, the orb was lazily floating away from us, going back up into the sky. Then it vanished in a horizontal line, which indicated sudden rapid movement. The white line across the black night sky disappeared a moment later, and I finally felt as if I could breathe again. What the hell was that thing? My wife had asked, sounding just as terrified as I felt. But I had no response. I couldn't even bring myself to share about the experience I'd had. If I did, I was worried the thing would come back. That the mere mention of it would summon it into our mists. When we were back inside the house, all of the phones, laptops, gaming systems, appliances, and anything else electronic in the house was dead. In an instant, they were transformed into giant, useless paperweights. As if an EMP had gone off. As the weeks went by, the glowing orbs became a more and more persistent problem. They also began affecting our livelihood. Eventually, I started to realize that this place was cursed. This house we had bought had some sort of hex on it. One morning in particular comes to mind. The morning when everything changed and I realized I could no longer stay at Skinwalker Ranch. I stood out in the field in the early morning sun looking at the dead cow, flies buzzing around its head. A strange hole was missing from its neck, the edges clean like they had been cut with a scalpel. The missing portion of its jugular had caused it to bleed out, and the evidence of that was coagulated all around my feet in a sticky puddle. My wife had named this cow Avocado. I could tell it was Avocado just by looking at it an egg-shaped black mark on its side with a white circle at the center, distinguished it from the others. The yearling would have gone off for slaughter in a month. Its untimely death would put us in the red even worse than we already were, especially since another three deaths had occurred in recent weeks, each time the same unexplainable injuries. The property had been nothing but trouble since we moved in. Nothing had gone right. My eyes scanned the property, trying to see if I could spot one of the orbs. The skies were clear and blue, completely cloudless. No glowing lights. Not today, at least. Why would anyone want to do this to an innocent animal, I thought, staring at the blank expression on the cow's face. My eye caught movement in the sky to the north, and I looked to see something whizzing past like a bullet. It was a round ball of bluish-white light, tracing a path across the field, heading for a patch of grass behind some nearby trees. It disappeared a moment later. That was when I realized the cattle were over in that field grazing. The orb was headed straight for them. No longer thinking rationally, only worried about our livelihood being wiped out, I raced across the sun-yellowed grass towards the clearing. Anxious moos and the sound of braying cattle could be heard through the trees. As fast as I could run, I felt so slow compared to those things which were terrorizing us. The evil orbs which came from the sky to torment us. The cows were all racing towards me, terrified of the blue orb. One of them crashed into me, knocking me to the ground, and I felt a hoof land just beside my head, which surely would have killed me if it had been just a few inches to the side. I stood to see the glowing orb's attention was focused on me now. Without any distinguishing features, it should have been impossible to tell where the wisp of light was turning. But somehow I could sense that it was looking right at me. And then, an instant later, it was on top of me. Inches away. It droned and undulated in the most unpleasant way. Like too much bass in the backseat of a car where you have no control over the stereo. Like a drill at the dentist burrowing into a back tooth when you realize there's not enough Novocaine in the world to quench the pain of what you're about to experience. Like the roar of an airplane engine from an inch away, or a case of tinnitus bad enough to make you go insane. And yet I couldn't move. I could only lay there feeling as if my skull were being torn apart by opposite forces too strong to resist. Was this what happened when people spontaneously combusted? Was this alien going to make me explode like an egg in the microwave? Suddenly, I heard my wife screaming something from behind me. The shotgun blast was deafening, 
but had no effect on the glowing orb. My wife reloaded and pumped the barrel once more. Then I heard another shot go off. Again, it seemed to do nothing. That was when the orb moved over me. Traveling towards my wife instead. It settled its presence around her and I screamed at her to run. She didn't look as if she was able to hear me anymore though. The shotgun dropped from her hand and I watched as her eyeballs rolled up, revealing the whites of her eyes and nothing else. She appeared possessed as the blue orb enveloped her, and her skin started to cook like meat over the barbecue. No! I screamed, scrambling to my feet and running over toward her. By the time I arrived though, she was nothing but a pile of black ash and cinders in the perfect shape of her form. As I dove into her, trying to rescue her from the light, the orb receded back into the sky, and I collided with the column of embers that had been my wife an instant earlier. It exploded into a black-gray cloud of dust, obliterating any evidence of what had just happened, and leaving only a scattered pile of ashes. I was left coughing and choking on her remains, covered in black soot. Part of me couldn't believe what had just happened. But when I looked to the ground beside me and I saw the shotgun she had been carrying with her, I knew. She had tried to save me, I thought to myself. She tried to save me and it had gotten her killed. After weeping for a while, unable to move or do anything, eventually I stood up and the ashes poured off of me and continued to cloud into the air around me as I walked slowly back towards the farmhouse my head hanging down. What was I going to do now? My wife was my whole life. Without her, the world seemed empty and hopeless. There was no point to anything anymore. I stumbled past the cows and they watched me with sad eyes. Climbing the porch steps, I opened the front door and stepped inside the house. The smell of delicious food being cooked on the stove greeted me immediately. Onions and garlic and the sounds of a knife chopping something on the cutting board. I ran into the kitchen, unable to believe my senses. And there she was. My wife, Christine, standing in the kitchen, chopping a bloody red piece of meat. She turned around with a large chef's knife in her hand smiling at me as I came in. Her eyes were the only thing about her that didn't look the same. Otherwise, she was a perfect match for the love of my life. The woman I had just seen turned to ash outside. But her eyes had no color, no irises. They were only pupils. All black. Hi, honey, she said, still holding the knife. I'm making your favorite dinner for tonight. Beef stew. Gotta use up avocado before she goes bad. She turned around and went back to the large slice of meat on the counter. It looked just like the piece that had gone missing from avocado. How did you know the cow was dead? I didn't tell you yet. You didn't have to tell me, sweetie. We're married. I know everything you do. I know all your deepest, darkest secrets. And pretty soon, you won't have to remember a thing. What does that mean, Christine? I asked, backing away out of the kitchen. But something stopped me. I bumped into the form of someone blocking my path. Someone tall. Spinning around, I saw a grinning, exact replica of me. Only with eyes as dark as coal and a sharp-toothed smile with canines much longer than mine have ever been. Its teeth were white, as if they had never been used. The knife slid into my back with little pain at first. I didn't even realize it had happened until I fell down and saw the blood. The two of them stood over me, watching as I slowly lost consciousness. What's for dinner, sweetie? New me asked his voice sounding far off and distant. Oh, you're gonna love it, honey. It's his favorite, beef stew. 
Mmm, sounds delicious. My wife and I were sitting on the front porch. It had been a long day of moving furniture and boxes into our new house. We were tired, red-faced, and sweating after sharing the burden between the two of us. The sun was setting on the horizon as we sipped warm beers and looked out over the landscape of our newly acquired ranch. Fields stretched off into the distance as far as the eye could see, not a neighbor in sight for miles. The cows were grazing, looking unhappy, their tails hanging straight down as they ignored the fresh grass all around them. I figured they were just upset from the long move. Why do you think they needed so many locks? My wife asked, taking a sip of her beer. It was the elephant in the room, so to speak. And I had to admit, I was curious about it as well. Every door in the house had a deadbolt on it. Inside and out. Not only that, but the windows were shielded by thick iron bars. The old owners had left long before we could ask them about it. Eh, folks who lived here before were probably shut-ins, you know? Hermits like your Uncle Steve. I joked. She laughed at the gentle barb. Yvette's uncle rarely left his house, unless it was for a fresh case of beer. We'll take them down and I'll fill the screw holes in with wood putty. Paint them over and they'll look good as new. You want to redo the trim anyway. And the bars on the windows? That'll take a bit more work, but I can get it done before the weekend. I'll just have to run over to the hardware store to grab a few things. Can't find some of my tools. I think I got lost during the move. My wife was no longer paying attention. She was now staring at some point far off in the distance. What's that? She asked, pointing. I followed her finger and looked to see a gray shape moving in the fields. At first I thought it was wild dog or a coyote, but no. It was too large for that. This was a wolf, and a big one. It seemed to be stalking deliberately toward us, marching at a steady, quick pace. It came up to our split rail fence and did the strangest thing. Instead of leaping over it or burrowing under it as I'd expected, it stood up on two legs like a person, ducked, and stepped through the middle of the two logs, one leg after the other. It was exactly how I would have done it. Once it was on the other side, it went back on four legs and started its progress toward us again. Then it looked up and saw us staring at it. The gray wolf stayed still for a few seconds, then disappeared in the tall grass suddenly. It was just gone. It didn't dive into the grass or duck down. It was there, and then a moment later it was gone. Vanished in the blink of an eye. The two of us sat uneasily on the porch, and I stood up to look in the distance, trying to spot the creature, but it was nowhere to be found. I'm going inside. You should come too, my wife said, sounding nervous. We went in and locked the doors at the front and back of the house. The bars stayed on the windows after that, and my wife didn't mention the deadbolts on the doors again either. The two of us went to bed that night with little talk between us. A big difference from the ecstatic chatter that had been the norm all day prior to the event with the wolf. Or whatever that thing was. I got the feeling wolf was not quite the right word. It was something else. That night, something even more disturbing happened to us both. I woke up in the early hours of the morning, around 3.30 a.m. according to the bedside alarm clock. When I looked next to me in the bed and saw my wife's spot was empty, I became immediately concerned for her safety. Where could she have gone at this time of night, I wondered. And that was when I heard her voice calling to me from outside the window, asking insistently for me to let her in. Her cries for help were muffled through the glass, and I lifted the heavy old window pane up to hear her better. What are you doing out there? I asked, worried about the wolf we'd seen earlier. I was looking around for glowing eyes, reflecting the moonlight nearby. Standing on two legs or four, I wasn't sure which to expect. I must have been sleepwalking, she said dreamily. The front door locked behind me somehow. You have to let me back in. 
please, it's cold out here. I'll be right down, I said, without thinking about how impossible all of that was. I was only concerned for her safety at that moment, and she had been known to sleepwalk occasionally, so that part seemed to make sense. I raced down the stairs in my boxers and grasped the front doorknob in my hand, turning it. Thankfully, it was locked, or who knows what might have happened. Reaching up to turn the lock, I was startled to hear a voice behind me. What are you doing? My wife asked. I jumped at the sound, my heartbeat quickening. But what terrified me even more was what I had just seen outside. Given the time frame it had taken me to get downstairs, it was impossible that it had been her. It was like someone else had been out there, wearing her skin and speaking in her voice. Was there an imposter outside, or... Or was this the imposter standing in front of me? Looking at the woman before me, the caring expression on her face, I suddenly had no doubt it was my wife, Yvette. Panting, I walked over to her and hugged her tightly. What's wrong? She asked. I didn't answer, afraid she would think I was losing my mind. Some things we don't speak of with anyone. Not even our significant others. We take them to our grave. Afraid that if we tell of these things out loud, it will make them true. And will make the source of the impossible things return. So instead I just took her hand and led her up the stairs. Looking back nervously over my shoulder at the front door. Waiting for the sound of a key turning in the lock. Or the sound of it being broken down by powerful forces outside my control. Instead, there was a gentle knock polite at first. But then the fist began to pound against the front door of the house louder and louder, more and more insistently. My wife stopped, turning around to look at me on the stairs. Who is that? she asked nervously. At this time of night? Just ignore it. Let's, let's go to bed. They'll go away. Eventually. We're safe in here. After a few moments of hesitation, she turned around and began going up the stairs once more, taking a couple nervous looks back as she did. We kept walking up the stairs as the pounding continued, devolving into steady scratching noises that didn't cease until daybreak. What were you doing down in the basement last night? My wife asked at the breakfast table the next morning. Neither one of us mentioned the sounds at the door the night before. We were both trying to act like it never happened. In the light of the morning, it seemed like a shared hallucination. A bad dream brought on by warm beer and too much time in the sun moving boxes without assistance. In the basement? I wasn't in the basement, I told her. Sure you were. You were calling my name, asking me to come down there. I looked at her with concern. When was this? Right before I found you at the front door. I figured I just missed you, that you found whatever you were looking for down in the basement and went to the kitchen for a snack or something. But then I found you by the front door. I was never in the basement last night. She looked at me, puzzled. Of course you were. Who else would have been calling for me down there? I debated telling her what I had seen outside and decided I probably should. We were clearly dealing with something very strange here, and we needed to be on the same team if we were going to figure it out. Yvette, did you go outside at all last night? No, what does that have to do with... Okay, so here's the thing. I saw you outside. At the same time when you were going down to the basement, you were calling at me from the front door, telling me you were sleepwalking and you were locked out. That's why I was at the door. I, I never went down to the basement, and I don't think that was really you outside either. I think there's something else causing all this to happen. What the hell could cause that to happen? I opened my mouth to answer when there was a polite rapping at the door. The two of us sat dead silent for a few moments, unsure what to do. The knocking came again, and I heard a man's voice muffled through the door, saying, There's a car here. Maybe they're out in the fields. Should we just leave it on the doorstep? A woman's voice asked. I don't like being here any more than you do, but that seems a bit rude. Maybe we should come back. 
Yvette and I both stood up, sensing that this was not the same entity from the night before. I don't know how I could tell, but I just could. This wasn't an evil presence, it was just some neighbors coming by to welcome us. And they sounded like they might know something more than we did about the ranch and its mysteries. I opened the front door and saw a man and a woman with their backs turned, walking away from us. They spun around when they heard the sound of the door opening up. Oh, hi there, we're the Turnbulls. Uh, we live down the road, technically next door, as if there is such a thing out here. Uh, but we do share an easement with you to access the river. Jack takes the cattle down that way sometimes for a change of scenery. The man put his arm around his wife's shoulder and whispered something in her ear. She abruptly stopped talking, realizing that she was rambling on nervously. Oh, come on now, Diane, I'm sure they don't want to get into all that. Look, we just wanted to stop by and welcome you to the neighborhood, so to speak. It's nice to have another couple living next door again. This place has been empty for so long. My wife and I looked at each other with surprise. As far as we knew, the place had been occupied right up until our arrival. It hadn't shown signs of disrepair or neglect, so we'd had no reason to think otherwise. Really? No wonder this place was such a bargain. How long was it empty for? The man and woman shared a look. Oh, you know, not that long. A few years. Anyways, we just wanted to bring you this casserole. We have a few errands to run, but it was nice meeting you both. Come on by our place anytime. We're number 56981. Next driveway up on your side, that way. The man said, hooking his thumb eastward. I had never seen anyone introduce themselves and run so quickly. I tried not to take it personally. It was so nice meeting you both, the woman said, taking a few quick steps towards my wife and handing her the casserole dish. You can keep that, by the way. It's Pyrex. Great for casseroles. She backed up to join her husband, looking around the property nervously as she did. Hey, can I ask you something? The two of them looked ready to run back to their car, but they stopped and nodded, shifting on their feet anxiously and waiting for me to speak. Have you guys ever seen anything... Uh, how should I put this? There's been a few weird occurrences since we moved in, and I was just wondering if you could tell us anything. Is this place haunted? Is that why it was so cheap? Look, I can tell you guys are nervous. Just, just give us something to work with, please. We're getting a little freaked out here. The woman looked pleadingly at her husband. He nodded to her, and she went back to the car and got in the passenger seat, where she sat darting her eyes from side to side. What exactly did you see? The man asked. Wait, no, don't tell me. It's better if we don't speak of them. They know when you talk about them. It's better if we don't. Well then, how do we get rid of them? You don't. These things have been around a lot longer than you or me. My wife and I get our share of strange events on the ranch next door too, but not as bad as here. This place... Well, there's something here that makes it special. Not in a good way, I'm sorry to say. I'd tell you more, but it would only make things worse. It always does. There was a sound of knuckles rapping against the glass, and I looked to see his wife banging on the car window, looking with wide eyes at us and pointing into the distance, toward the fields. My eyes followed where she was pointing, and I looked to see the large gray wolf was back and it was moving towards us again. I told you, we're not meant to speak of them. I need to go. The two of you should decide soon if you want to stay. This place changes you. It will take things from you. You only get so long to decide. If you wait to see what the changes will be, it will already be too late. Trust me. With that, he turned away and went back to his car. He started the engine and drove off much quicker than I would have thought safe on a dirt driveway, swerving and leaving a cloud of dust hanging in the air around us, obstructing my view for a few seconds. When I turned around again, the wolf in the field was much, much closer. It was about 50 yards away and closing in fast. It was looking at me intently. My wife was running back towards the house, yelling at me to come, but I was frozen now, watching the wolf as it stood on its hind legs again. Not a wolf. Stop calling it a wolf. It's not a wolf. It's just trying to fool you into thinking that's what it is, but it's so much more dangerous than that. I tried to take a step, but my legs wouldn't budge. 
My eyes were locked on the wolf as it began to stalk towards me. No longer an animal, but something else wearing an animal suit. The ancient, leathery-skinned humanoid beneath the wolf armor could be glimpsed occasionally as it strode like a hunter in my direction, taking long steps moving low to the ground. The fur pieces were simply strapped onto it like clothing. The wolf head strapped on like a hat. What are you doing? Get in here! My wife yelled one more time, and my foot suddenly started to move. As soon as it did, I found I was unfrozen and finally able to start running, and not a second too soon. The house was close, but the thing was fast. When it saw me beginning to run, it became a wolf again in an instant. The idea that it was anything but that seemed ludicrous. As I watched it race toward me on all fours, its snapping jaws dripping saliva as it dove to cut me off. This thing was a massive gray wolf through and through. It could be nothing but that. And yet my eyes had begged otherwise just a moment before. If not for my wife, it might have gotten me. But she saw what was happening and took a large rock we had been using as a doorstop and threw it straight at the thing's head. It missed, hitting the beast in the shoulder instead, but it was enough to drive it back for a brief second. Which was all I needed. I ran into the house and slammed the door shut behind me. An instant later, the scratching began again. Soon there was another one at the back door, scratching it as well. The sounds continued for hours. When the noises stopped and I finally ventured outside again, I found that three of the cattle had been killed. The others were scared out of their wits, hiding huddled together in a corner of the field near the house. Their eyes darted around, reminding me of how the neighbors had looked as they scanned our property for things lurking in the shadows. I was beginning to suspect we were not going to be able to stay in this place much longer. Even if we could survive, this was no way to live. That night, my wife and I sat in the living room with all the blinds and curtains drawn, discussing what we would do. The house wouldn't sell quickly. That much was obvious based on the neighbor's statements. The two of us decided we would leave in the morning regardless. We would stay in a motel until we found an apartment to rent, sacrificing all of our investment in the house. Even if we put it up for sale again, it would be a long, long time before we made any portion of our money back. But it was too dangerous and too terrifying to stay. I'm going to bed, my wife said, looking tired. Come upstairs soon, okay? I don't want to be alone. I'll be up in a minute, I told her. I just want to grab a glass of water. She nodded sleepily and went up the stairs slowly, looking depressed. We had dreamed about this move for so long, and now it was all coming to ruins. I felt sad about it, too. I went to the kitchen and poured a glass of water. After drinking it down in one long gulp, I decided I needed another. It had been a hell of a day, and I'd been too distracted to drink anything. A noise came from upstairs. A scraping sound, like claws. Setting down the glass, I turned around and listened closely. Yvette? She didn't reply. I took a few steps across the linoleum floor of the kitchen before calling out again. Once again, there was no answer. By the time I got to the bottom of the stairs, my heart was pounding so fast and hard I felt like it would beat right out of my chest. I opened my mouth to call her name once more when I saw it. The wolf that wasn't a wolf strode on two legs across the gap at the top of the stairs, then disappeared around the corner, heading towards my wife. It was so quick that I thought for a moment I could have imagined it. Just a gray blur that was gone in an instant. If not for the fact that it looked down the stairs at me and smiled, its long canines gleaming in the light, its eyes pure blackness. I ran up the stairs as fast as I could, terrified of what it would do to her. When I got to the second floor, I looked down the hall to see all the doors were closed. It was as if the whole thing had really just been my imagination. Taking an unsteady step towards the bedroom, my heartbeat did not slow down even slightly. My hand was shaking as I reached for the doorknob, turning it and entering the master bedroom. I entered hesitantly finding the room dark and my wife asleep in bed. 
Part of me wanted to wake her up, but for some reason I didn't. It will be fine. Just go to bed, my irrational thoughts said. My pounding heart began to slow and my eyelids grew heavy. This is fine, my mind told me. Everything is fine. Just go to sleep now. Trying not to think of what I had seen just moments before, I climbed into bed, getting in next to my wife and shivering while my body warmed up beneath the sheets. There was a soft sound of padding footsteps outside the bedroom door, and then a scratching sound. Something wants to get inside the bedroom, and a strange, foreign voice in my mind is telling me to let it in. The story you just heard was written by me, and a variation of it previously featured on the Doctor No Sleep podcast and YouTube channel. If you'd like to check out their channel for more content, please check out the description below. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. If you'd like another way to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, you'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story, just like these fine folks. Many have already been featured in a story taking place in the strange and supernatural town of Hollow's End. If you haven't watched it yet, check out the Hollow's End playlist on my channel. I'm really proud of it, and I think it's some of the best stuff I've written so far. My favorite part has been coming up with characters for members and using their suggestions as a jumping off point. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.